just in case we have any troubles uh, in terms of a, a need to, to exit the, uh, the building for some reason. We're not going to, but if we do, just look to me and I'll, uh, I'll direct you either down the stairs or out the back or something like that. Uh, we've got a great uh, uh, couple of events uh, this morning. Uh, first up, we've got a, a conversation with Vice Admiral John Hill. Uh, everybody here knows who he is, the director of the Missile Defense Agency. Uh, he's taken over that post uh, in June. Uh, we're going to have just a conversation for the next hour uh, and then some uh, Q&A from, from all of you. And then we're going to uh, take a break, coffee break, uh, and then we'll come back and have a, a panel discussion with a, a bunch of folks from industry to kind of say, okay, what's, what's out there in the cone of the possible that we should be thinking about uh, uh, for the future? So, so let's just go ahead and get it started. Uh, Admiral Hill, thanks for coming out again. Um, uh, this is a, a, as you'd like to say, this is a big inflection point for the missile defense enterprise. I wonder if you might just sort of give us some, uh, at the big picture level, uh, what's changed and what is changing uh, that affects your whole mission set and the agency. Okay. Well, great. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, good morning. Uh, always great to be here at CSIS. I was commenting as we walked in that it's always such a diverse uh, audience, uh, different backgrounds, and I, and I just think it's great. And it's always just good kind of just getting out of the normal uh, doldrums of what you do uh, day in and day out. Um, as you mentioned, um, missile defense really is at an inflection point, and uh, it's really driven by threat. Uh, you know, when you, when you look at uh, our history and, and really kind of my background, um, threat will drive what we do. And so when you, I was reading, reading a great article the other day by George Friedman from Geopolitical Futures, and he kind of uh, simplified, uh, he kind of talked about how things sort of started ballistically, right? So when you think about uh, shooting a bullet, right, it's ballistic, or a ballistic missile is ballistic, and his point was that in general, it depends on how good the football player is, right, if he's gonna hit his target. And, uh, and in general, because of the inaccuracy of ballistic shots, you tend to either change your warhead type to have a more lethal blast radius, or you go down some other path, or you shoot a lot of them, right? In our world, we, we, we call that raid. Now, we responded to that uh, through missile defense, ballistic missile defense, uh, with precision. Well, we came back to a hit-to-kill solution, um, although the enemy was just firing a lot to deal with his inaccuracies. Uh, what we're finding as we move into the future is almost a uh, different view, and where George Friedman takes it is, is down the path of precision-guided munitions as the way that you, you know, up your game from something as an, you know, from an inaccurate uh, ballistic missile. And what we're seeing the adversaries do is all of the above, right? It's, it's precision guidance, it is maneuvers, it's just unpredictability. Right. Ballistic threats, very predictable. Uh, the future ballistic threats, not so predictable. Hypersonic threats, not predictable. And uh, when you get into cruise missiles, uh, you know, for my Navy friends I see sitting around, you know, the unpredictability of a maneuvering cruise missile low on the deck is very challenging. It challenges your sensor architecture, it challenges your fire control, and it challenges the methods by which you engage. So I, I do believe that uh, we are at an inflection point in how we're gonna defend not only the homeland, but our four deployed forces and our friends and allies, and uh, we have to think differently. And so it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to me. Uh, I had an old uh, mentor of mine many years ago say, well, you know, John, there's always the right time for the right officer. And uh, she recently uh, told me, hey, you're, you're the right guy for today. And, um, and when I look, peer into the future, uh, I recognize that it's, it's time to, to adjust and uh, be ready for the future. And the other big uh, piece is the threat, and we're talking about different actors, Russia and China. That's a Absolutely. big, big difference. Right, and uh, so if you go back and look at our charter, right, we've always been focused on the North Korean threat, uh, focused on a growing uh, Iranian threat. Um, I think as you move into these other threat spaces, now you're talking about uh, different adversaries. And so that's an inflection point and a change for the Missile Defense Agency, too. Good. All right, we got a lot to cover. Yep. Uh, I thought we might just start with uh, uh, Homeland Defense, uh, kind of what's going on with the GMD program and the Next Generation Interceptor, how we got here. Your thoughts on all that? Yeah, um, so GMD, as uh, many of you might know, uh, you know, started roughly 15 years ago. We put it in the ground. It's, uh, it's, it's time to kind of recognize the fact that the nation recognizing that defense is an important imperative. You could have chosen all those years ago to not defend, say that the threat is just too hard. Uh, but the nation stood up and said, we're going to move very quickly to deploy capability and have a deterrent, right? So defense in itself is a deterrent. Uh, defense certainly buys you time. And we've had 15 years of, of a capability uh, stationed primarily up in uh, Fort Greeley with uh, associated sensor architecture and globally deployed uh, fire control that I think has been very successful. Uh, whenever the time is right, uh, Tom, I'd uh, love to show the, uh, the most recent uh, flight test from the March timeframe. Now, now's good. Of that. Yeah. now's good. Yeah, well, why don't we do that just since it's in the morning, maybe 
maybe you haven't had your coffee yet. And uh, so we'll show that as a start uh, and as a preamble to kind of get that, uh, that video started. I, I would say that it, it was uh, years in the making because of the complexity of what we were doing. Uh, an intercontinental ballistic missile class threat, uh, mimicking the architecture uh, that many of you will recognize. So uh, radars feeding the fire control system, the uh, discriminating radars providing discrimination, talking to the missiles, firing of two, uh, two interceptors, uh, one of the, uh, the most newest uh, interceptors and one of the older ones, just, just to show that we can detect engage and once we've engaged the primary object that we can very quickly figure that out through kill assessment and move to the next uh, lethal object and that's that was really the the high level view of it we also want to have ship on uh, ship on station to, to start uh, uh, tracking an ICBM threat so as we go into the uh, the future of testing against those sorts of threats uh, from ships uh, using the SM3 missile that we would have that risk reduction uh, in place as well as other assets where we're pulling data it was uh, like most tests uh, you're data rich you can capture a lot lot of uh, information to kind of help you uh, with the future where you're going. So we'll um, kick it over to the well, video. I'll tell you now. what, I'll just ask, ask the folks in the back to pull up the video, please, and we'll, we'll get started. Um, it's probably a, a slide or two in. Uh, as you mentioned, the, this is the 15th anniversary of, uh, of the initial defensive capability right. back in, uh, I think, the last week of September of 2004. Right. So uh, it's, been, uh, it's been up there for a while now. Yeah. So There uh, it is. So, so there, there, there's, there's the overview there. You'll see the, uh, the ICBM launch from the lower left. You see a TPY-2 out on Wake Island mimicking a, a radar that would be somewhere in the Pacific. You have the sea-based sea X-band radar, the big golf ball as we call it. You see the ship out there. You see two missiles coming in. We launched uh, from, from Vandenberg, again, the newest configuration and one of the older configurations. Um, you see Aegis Ashore uh, reposited uh, out of uh, PMRF, and you'll see some other air assets and space assets in play. So this was uh, the opportunity to work across multiple time zones, multiple ranges, having every asset uh, that we had to collect the data and to demonstrate and pull down data to show that we can do fire control quality data across the board. So we'll pop the video whenever you're ready. I think you might have to advance to the next slide for that. Yeah, I think they're working on it. March 25th, 2019, the Missile Defense Agency, or MDA, conducted an historic test of the nation's homeland missile defenses over the Pacific Ocean. This was the first test involving the launch of two interceptors, and it resulted in the intercept of a long-range ballistic missile target with countermeasures. Following their release from the missile in space, missile defense countermeasures are intended to trick the missile defense system into missing the lethal object. From the Marshall Islands in the Pacific to the coast of California, across more than 4,800 miles, MDA deployed two powerful radars, one on Wake Island and the other in the Pacific Ocean. The two interceptors were ready in silos at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California and they carried kill vehicles designed to collide with the target. Once launched from the Kwajalein Atoll, the target missile rocketed towards space, heading east in the direction of the United States. Following detection by satellites using infrared sensors, the forward-based radar on Wake Island saw the missile and tracked it as it ascended. The radar also saw the countermeasures released by the target and sent this data to the command and control, battle management, and communication system the brains of the missile defense system. This information on the target was then passed to the fire control stations in Colorado Springs and in Fort Greeley, Alaska, which then sent the information to the sea-based X-band radar stationed in the Pacific Ocean. The SBX radar picked up the target as it flew through space and collected additional and more precise information to send back to the fire control stations in the United States. Once the data was received by the warfighters operating the system, they fired the first, or lead, interceptor. Less than a minute later, they launched the second, or trail, interceptor. Accelerating into space, the interceptors burned through their first two stages, and the third stage of each interceptor propelled the kill vehicles towards the target. After receiving additional data from the radars, the two kill vehicles used their sensors to find the objects within the target cluster. They then maneuvered with the lead kill vehicle zeroing in on and colliding with the primary target, obliterating it. The trailing kill vehicle was able to see through the intercept flash and debris to hit what the system determined to be the second most lethal object, also destroying it through the force of impact. This historic test provided the warfighter with increased confidence in the operation of America's homeland missile defenses, which stand ready around the clock 
to protect the country from long-range missile attack. Okay. So, who <laughs> right. Yeah, there, there you go. So you mentioned a bunch of yeah. sensors in that test. Yeah. Uh, airborne, space-based. What's, what's the significance of having all those sensors, and I don't know if this was the most number in a test ever, um, what's the significance of that for kind of contributing to operational uh, realism going forward? Yeah, I think uh, when, when you uh, think of range-based sensors, uh, oftentimes it's, it's really about just making sure you accomplish what you want to accomplish, and if there's uh, any sort of anomaly in the test, you have the data to pull down and to assess, and so that's, that's primarily, primarily what we'll do uh, when we go to any range. But when you bring in uh, space-based assets uh, from an operational perspective, uh, when you uh, afford the time and maybe even delay a test a little bit to, to ensure that you've got looks uh, coming from uh, other assets up in space and you specifically put ships on station to collect data on their radar types. You, you get a, uh, a lot of different uh, phenomenology uh, there that you can either assess for direct fire control or you can fuse, uh, fuse that data uh, for future use. Uh, or for some intended use uh, downstream. So uh, it's, it's always good to have multiple uh, ways of looking at things. In the video, you, you heard uh, you know, the, the GBI was going up and it was receiving updates uh, from radars, uh, terrestrial base radars uh, being fused up uh, to the missile itself. Uh, and that's, that's a big part of uh, closing the fire control loop to get to that precision guidance required for hit to kill. Now you made a point though of also mentioning the Aegis Ashore yep. site, tracking this ICBM threat. Right. I mean, I think the significance of this has perhaps been lost a little bit. Why, what's, what's the, the future utility of having an Aegis radar and Aegis combat system tracking an ICBM? Sure. Uh, so, so in general, uh, when you're dealing with the longer range threats, uh, you try to leverage <coughs> off-board sensors uh, so that you can have an engage on remote capability. That, that's really the, uh, the intent uh, for you just to expand the battle space as far as we can because we have missiles that just outfly the organic radar. But uh, when the organic radar can uh, detect and track, you want to use that because that, that gives you the, the most precise fire control solution. Uh, so it's really about precision. So engage on remote, off-board, great, expand your battle space. Uh, but uh, I was raised in that world and I think most uh, you know, COs of ships afloat today you know, love to have that locked up in their own radar before they uh, fire or while it's firing. So uh, the significance of it is extended uh, battle space and, uh, and it does allow you, you know, if you go read our mission statement, right, it's, it's always about uh, you know, all phases of flight uh, at all ranges and uh, that's, that's an important aspect of, of being able to track it. So the Missile Defense Review talked about you know, building uh, uh, Missile Field 4 and right. uh, 20 new GBIs. Uh, could you sort of speak to how that's going and, and what, sure. for instance, the, the, the building of Missile Field 4 means kind of on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so uh, I was up in Alaska uh, a few weeks ago and a uh, great, great trip, you know, uh, as, as a deputy um, uh, prior to uh, working for General Reeves, uh, I was that stay-behind guy. So uh, this that was really the first trip I decided to take was to go to Alaska. Because uh, if you look at where MBA has gone over the years, right, uh, we'll talk always about our the primary workforce being in Huntsville, Alabama, and, and that's important. But when you start to deploy capabilities, that sort of uh, center of gravity shifts to the operational side of the house very quickly. And I would say that the state of Alaska is incredibly important in what we're doing. When you think about the radars in Shemia, you think about the testing we do up in Kodiak, uh, the missile fields, the radars going up and clear, you know, that, that is clearly a center point. So I wanted to make sure I had uh, feet on ground. Uh, so I wanted to see the missile field uh, in its state of construction because it's, it's one of the few opportunities uh, where you can go up and really see all stages. You can see a completed missile field, you can see the interceptors in the ground, and then you can see the various stages of construction. Uh, pretty amazing time, probably the only time I would have been able to do it. Uh, but Missile Field 4 becomes important um, even if we're not hitting the mark time-wise for those additional 20 uh, GBIs that we intended because it gives you the ability to do maintenance and uh, to ensure that that is on track and ready to roll. Uh, we've been constrained in the past. Uh, if we had uh, a maintenance activity we need to do, uh, you know, pull the missile out, goes into a missile assembly uh, uh, building, but you can't really swap silos and move them around as freely as we need to. So in the interim, we're going we're gonna to use uh, the additional uh, silos that we have in Missile Field 4 uh, for maintenance activity. Um, it gives us the opportunity to upgrade the older missile fields by moving those, uh, those interceptors over. So there's, there's real value in it. And the fact that we are so far down the path on, on completing that field, uh, we, we've got uh, support uh, within the department and, and, and on the Hill to, to complete that missile field. Uh, so to answer your question about, uh, well, what about that extra 20? 
so we're, we're moving uh, down the path, and uh, we, we've talked about it before where we had a requirements uh, issue, and, and we, we just weren't ready to, to complete that design, and we've decided to reset the program. And we're in the position now to compete at the all brown level. And uh, we've come through two uh, draft uh, requests for proposal uh, with industry. And it's important to engage with industry because we're doing things a little differently here. It's not just about the what I'll call the warhead, the, the kill vehicle, it is now about that whole missile from the booster on up through the, uh, the warhead itself. And you want to have as much discussion as you can with industry so that you can understand art of the possible. Um, we're getting a lot of criticism now, rightfully so. Uh, on timelines and cost, uh, and I think that's a healthy debate, and what can be done in the interim, and what can you do to pull that in, and I think that uh, what allows us uh, speed as we go downstream, to, to, but also to ensure we have the right capability, uh, that interaction with industry is really important, and so we're in the middle of that now. Great, great. Uh, so the next generation interceptor is obviously going to, um, I think, soak up a lot of the discussion here. Uh, is there a sense for kind of the trade-offs between timeline and capability? Because uh, you know, especially since those interceptors on the ground are some of them 15 years old. Right. Um, what's what's realizing it's it's not fully out there on the street yet, but but what's how are you thinking through that? Yeah. So so we're looking at all options is probably the the best way to do it. Um, as we when we came through and terminated the uh, the RKB contract, uh, the first response was to, okay, how, how do we take care of the existing fleet? How do we get that existing fleet to be at the highest state of readiness for the longest amount of time possible? And so so we've come through that drill. We have a very good understanding of what it's going to take to to get there. I would say the the specific course on what we'll do to maintain reliability levels at the highest level uh, is still in discussion today. Um, and then where we are with the next generation interceptor, we have a sense of cost, we have a sense of time, but we have not awarded a contract yet. Um, so I don't have the specifics on, you know, how far do we, are we able to pull that in? What will that configuration look like? We just don't know that yet. Yet I get a lot of questions on, you know, what's this thing really going to look like? And uh, well, don't know because it's a competition. And so we have uh, a set of requirements that I think are uh, uh, very good requirements. Uh, will set us up for the long term. Our, our intent, by the way, was to make sure that our, our mid-course capability was going to uh, be in place for a long time because I think we're going to need it for a long time. That the threat's not going away, and so it's important that we get it right. Great. So. Well, why don't we shift? I'm realizing these things, of course, sure. blur together, but yeah. uh, shift to the, the regional uh, side a little bit. Right. What's the uh, what's the path forward? What's going on for the Aegis, uh, yeah. that, and, and everything else. Yeah, so um, my other trip uh, that I recently returned from was uh, being in Romania and in Poland. Uh, again, to get feet on ground, to understand state of play. So Romania was a, a great site to visit because the uh, construction's complete. Uh, we have an operational site in place. Uh, I like to tell the story of driving up and having a Romanian security guard meet me along side by side with a Navy uh, gate guard, uh, you know, young sailor there. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a small naval base and it's uh, being run by the Navy. Um, the uh, tactical operators are, are Navy, same, same kind of sailors that serve on ships today. Uh, so it's a great story, and I'm, I'm asked all the time about what do you mean by transition and transfer? Well, that, that's, that's just a great story because uh, you can see it uh, in, in live living color. Uh, great site, uh, and it's there for a reason, you know, primarily to put in place to, to defend Europe against a growing uh, Iranian threat. Uh, that's been well known and understood. But obviously because of the neighborhood, uh, most of the discussions were about, you know, a different uh, adversarial, uh, you know, Something to the east. Yeah, something to the east, yeah. right. And, and that's okay. It was a great uh, conversation, and then I was able to, to then head off to Poland. I would say the importance of those sites, and what we often forget, is they're part of the European phase adaptive approach, right, uh, protect Europe. But it's not just about two operational Aegis shore sites. Uh, it includes the ships that are operating in the area. We have our uh, four destroyers that are stationed out of Rota, uh, Spain, and uh, they deploy and they're on patrol. Uh, they have a formidable capability on them, and, uh, but they're often forgotten because they may not be in the same place at one time, which is right. Uh, it's a maneuver force. You want them to be maneuvering. You want them in the area uh, to provide that kind of protection uh, for Europe. So I would say that the general tone and tenor uh, in Europe was very positive in terms of the capability that those systems bring. Uh, it, it's representative of the power of maneuver forces uh, at sea, uh, sensors that can, can move and be relocated, the ability to move missile magazines you know, uh, across the ocean and have them uh, stationed on land, and having a very well-trained 
uh, group of sailors that, that are operating those uh, officers and sailors. Uh, so yeah, great great uh, capability. Um, when you when you look at that capability and, and you look at what the end state will be for. Uh, the European phase adaptive approach. Um, you look at the the type of missile, the, the SM3 Block 2A. Uh, Congress has directed us to go off and uh, assess that program through a test uh, to take on the longer range intercontinental ballistic missile. We are working to go execute that uh, next year. Uh, the pacing item has always been the target, um, so because that wasn't originally in the plan. And mm -hmm. so we are on path uh, to build and execute that. Uh, again, the uh, risk reduction that was done during that March test that we just showed, FTG 11, of having a ship out there collect data to do simulated engagements. That's and, what I was going at earlier. They executed a number of simulated engagements based on the tracks that they were having and the, the, the use of uh, data across the, the battle force uh, that's enabled by C2BMC, our command and control and battle management. Um, I have high confidence we're going to be able to go in and uh, be successful with that test. But then what does it mean if you, if you conduct a test? Does that mean instantaneously that capability is out at sea? The answer is no. You have to be able to do, you have to have the combat system upgrades in place, uh, which we have installed uh, in our Aegis Ashore sites. And so they're ready to roll and uh, you have to have a missile production line. So pretty excited uh, last week that we had the initial production decision made for the SM3 Block 2A. So uh, we're moving down the path to, uh, to produce those missiles in numbers, get them out there. Uh, they're needed in the fleet. They're needed to Aegis Ashore. And if they have that capability uh, to take down those, uh, those longer threats, all the better, more tools for the combatant commanders uh, at their disposal for a layered defense in terms of ballistic missiles. And that goes to the, the blurring between homeland and, and regional. Yes. That at least opens up some, some possibilities. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, Congress has also said, go look at that, at least for some pieces of U.S. territory. Right. THAAD's been deployed at Hawaii on right. various occasions. Right. Uh, anything uh, kind of on the, the THAAD side of the house to, to talk about? Yeah, well, where I get excited about that is the uh, dynamic force employment that the Army's doing today. And so when we were upgrading the uh, Romania site, the, the Army just uh, rolled in, coordinated uh, with UCOM, and put, put up the THAAD battery. Uh, it was there, demonstrated we can land it very quickly, did the upgrade on Aegis Shore, and then THAAD uh, pulled right out and uh, back, back to garrison. Um, to me, you know, when you go back and you read the National Defense Strategy that talks about this sort of dynamic, unpredictable force employment, Perfect example, uh, MDA in support of the Army to deploy THAAD quickly and to extract uh, THAAD very quickly. Uh, quick upgrades on Aegis Ashore, back online, uh, you know, up and operating. Uh, to me, it's, it's the kind of world that we need to live in. If, if you see how all the services today are very quickly deploying in areas where they traditionally have not deployed in a while, and see them going in and doing that's exactly what we, want, what we want the forces to do. So our role as an agency is to fully support uh, what the services need in terms of ships for deployed out and down on, you know, out on the edge where they need to be um, and making sure they've got the sparing, the support, the training, uh, those sorts of things. And that's, that's just really the role of the agency. Another pretty cool uh, piece of the THAAD and really THAAD Patriot was yeah. uh, uh, I think a recent test up in Alaska uh, yeah. talk about, you know, remote launch stuff, right. Uh, right. Uh, but also kind of the Geon stuff for, for USFK. Yeah, we're, 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 uh, we're pretty excited about that. That's, that's a tough environment uh, out on the peninsula. And uh, we worked uh, initially with General Brooks, now with uh, General Abrams uh, out there in theater to, to do that integration. And that integration wasn't as easy as um, most people might think. Um, in an earlier discussion, we were talking about the, uh, I would say the risk of talking about plug and play. Not everything necessarily plugs and plays. When you have uh, radars that are built, purpose built for a part of the battle space and another radar that's built maybe in a different frequency band, which is true for, for that and Patriot, and you have missiles that speak to those radars in a different frequency, and they're purpose-built for different parts of the, uh, of the battle space. One might be multi-mission, another one might be BMD-specific. When you say, hey, go integrate, um, that's not so easy. So, uh, but we did move down a path. We laid down uh, the priorities uh, that we needed to do for USFK, and uh, that is going along well. We have had a remote launcher test, and so if you can separate the launchers from the battery and move that out forward, that is expanding your battle space. It's almost like an engage on remote kind of capability because you move the battery out further. Gives you gives a combatant command again, uh, lots of uh, lots of uh, flexibility. If you can then launch a Patriot missile using THAAD data and vice versa, that's the path we're going down. We've we've gone through a couple of those tests so far. We have one or two more to go before we can declare uh, capability and material release with the Army. Um, what I like about that capability is it's not unique to the peninsula in uh, South Korea. It is extensible to any combatant command. And I think we'll see a demand signal once we have that capability fully tested and uh, certified uh, for deployment. Great. And of course, very closely related. I mean, when you talk about the fact that 
the kind of getting beyond the bumper sticker of right. sensor shooter integration. It's not right. so easy. But that would seem to suggest all the more reason why from a BMDS wide or a missile defense system wide enterprise, all the more reason to make sure things are being coordinated. Uh, you know, configuration, control, all this kind of stuff to make sure that it doesn't get more stovepipe. You, you bet. And uh, so, so now I'm getting really excited, Tom. So the um, <laughs> so so if you just look at the the Pacific Theater, for example, where you have a uh, an integrated Thad and Patriot capability, and then you tie in the ships that are off the coast, right? And then you sort of imagine, well, if we're going to be defending against those sorts of threats you want to be able to leverage as much data as possible, right? Anywhere you go, it's, it's usually about sensor limitations. So if you have some sort of missile defense event happening, uh, we're not going to be out there by ourselves. There will be ships off the coast. You want to have that data into C2BMC that you can feed to the Thad and Patriot batteries. Uh, if you have aircraft in the area that have exquisite sensors on them, you want those sensors tied into C2BMC so that data can be fed to those ships, to those Patriot batteries, to those THAAD batteries. That's the world we're living in today. It's, it's, it really is a multi-domain environment. And doing things like integrating THAAD and Patriot and bringing them into the same uh, link architecture with Aegis ships and then having them tied into the same sensors that are tied into the homeland defense, uh, ground-based mid-course defense fire control system, you now have a multi-domain environment where you're leveraging everything, whether it's unmanned air vehicles or it's aircraft, and I think it really does provide a problem set and changes the calculus for the adversary. And so we're moving down that road very aggressively, and I think that is part of our future. Uh, it is not something we're going to complete and put on the shelf. It is part of the future. That's always been the vision, of course. That's the word integrated is right there in the definition right. of, the, of, the, of the agency and the BMDS. Yeah, but I would say, you know, you, you've got to carefully engineer each kill chain, right? So it's not as easy as, oh, well, we're going to um, take in this Hawk battery and everything's going to play well. Well, you, you got to make sure that's fully engineered and that it makes sense and that the data can move and that that data can be ingested. One of the reasons I mentioned radars that operate at different frequencies and uplinks that are at different rates and things like that is because you have to account for that. And uh, it's, it's, there's real engineering work to be done there. Yeah. Of course, there's also the, uh, the multinational, as well as right. multi-domain, multi-system, right. uh, but at least the interoperability with, uh, right. with partners and allies. Um, right. We've got some, a lot of exercises that contribute right. to that, but, right. but other, uh, other activities you'd like to highlight there? Yeah, well, one of them, just, just because I'm a naval officer, I can't, can't help myself, is Formidable Shield uh, 19, and we're planning for Formidable Shield 21. It used to be known as the Maritime Missile Defense uh, Forum. Uh, at sea demonstrations that started back in uh, 15. Uh, for years, it was bilateral, um, just testing back and forth on interoperability. The whole focus was can we pass data just for situational awareness? Then it became can we pass data for fire control? And then it became let's go to sea. And so now we do that uh, every other year, uh, sponsored by UCOM uh, off the coast of Hebrides. So we're on a, on a different range that's managed differently than any range I've ever seen in the U.S., which makes it just great fun. And you've got a you know, fair number of ships, typically on the, the order of about eight countries that are playing. And, and it's sort of a test bed. Uh, it allows uh, the different navies to come in, try out new radar upgrades, for example. Uh, launch a target, see how everybody does, compare data together, bilateral or multilateral. And, uh, and that, is just, that just makes, uh, makes it better. If you can establish uh, that sort of maritime um, connection and then extend that into the terrestrial-based uh, NATO uh, links, then now you've got something that uh, is more than just a singular navy uh, trying to deal with a uh, you know, pretty tough threat in that area. Now, now you've got numbers and you've got interoperability, and that's the, that's the path we're on. Well, it's not the only uh, piece by any means. You just no. hit the, the operational side. But, but what about you know, building partner missile defense capacity, uh, FMS, things like that? Yeah. So one of the more uh, visible uh, ones that we had uh, a couple months ago, again, up in Kodiak, uh, was with the, the country of Israel. So geographically constrained uh, in an area that uh, testing there and doing hit to kill in that environment, not necessarily the, the, the best place to go do it. So by moving them to Kodiak, which in itself was, was a feat, uh, and then using uh, US um, sensors and things like that, because uh, as surrogates, for example, because we didn't want to remove, say, the radars that are being operationally employed today, uh, showing that you have interoperability just at the data level, right? The fact that we can ingest that data and use it to support a, an Israeli system uh, in itself was a great example of uh, interoperability, uh, very good uh, for the defensive capabilities that, uh, that are required uh, there in Israel. So that was very successful this year, um, and we'll continue to do that. We we have great partnerships uh, with the United Arab Emirates, 
Uh, we have an FMS case, so you asked about that earlier and about uh, potential upgrades for that system. Uh, you know, that's been around for a long time. And uh, THAAD ought to evolve uh, with the threats as they come. And with the FMS case with Saudi Arabia, we have the ability to get things like the production line for radars going again, uh, continue building out interceptors, add in additional capability as we go, which is a benefit to the United States, it's a benefit to the joint forces, uh, all a good thing. So, um, you know, you mentioned, um, or I mentioned Aegis Shore earlier, I'll talk about Japan just a little bit, kind of swinging back uh, to the Pacific. Uh, Japan is working through uh, their um, plan to put in uh, two Aegis Shores uh, there to protect their country. It becomes their national missile defense. And what's fascinating about how they're going to do business there is their, their ground forces will operate the system, which is kind of a cool way to do it. Um, so we had that big debate. Soldiers operating Aegis. I oh, know, it's goodness, crazy, Dogs right? and cats living together. Right, so now we'll have soldiers from another country going through our Aegis training and readiness school, which will be fascinating. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a great way, and, and we've done those trades before in the U.S. Should, should those uh, sites uh, be operated by uh, Army? You know, because it, it is uh, you know, potentially, if you, if you decide to build Aegis ashore in the United States, that's a conversation we'll have to open again, uh, just because it's kind of within the Army's lane to defend the homeland. Right, right. So. Uh, well, we could spend the whole hour just on FMS, but oh, I know. moving, I think you've got a, a chart on uh, kind of the, the big MDA mission sure. set. Sure. Uh, if we could maybe pull that up. Uh, you, you know, I, I think when you spoke a couple months ago, you, uh, you know, dropped the, uh, the B from uh, right. the ballistic missile, just talking about the missile defense uh, right. mission. Uh, but this mission set is in some ways the central question for the future of the agency. Right. You've got a lot, lot going on there. you want to speak to that? Yeah, sure. So the, uh, the, the earlier versions of this, uh, I used to call it the placemat, and I still do torture my 14-year-old daughter on this every night. Um, so we used to talk about the... It, it's, it's great. She really knows it well now. So the, uh, the, you know, the, the main uh, trajectory from left to right there is the ballistic trajectory. We talked about that being a... Um, you know, she now says Keplerian trajectory very well. Uh, predictable, but becoming less predictable over time. And then we've added in the hypersonic, you know, a, a nominal, uh, you know, low ballistic, coming back down, glide phase, maneuvering in the end, in the end game just to kind of show that we're, we're moving in that direction. Uh, you see the, the boost phase side of the house, the ascent and the mid course. You know, ideally in a layered defense uh, world, uh, all types of missiles, you want to have that terminal capability, you want to hit them, hit them in descent, you want to catch them in mid course. You want to catch them before they start ballooning countermeasures or they start maneuvering. And so, so that's really been the focus of, of how we're doing things. We tie it all together with the command and control. For those of you who weren't familiar with that, that's, that's what I meant when I said CTBMC. Is it's really the tying together of all that. That is where the operators touch the system. And so it's really important to have the right data on the glass, right? Get the tracks on the glass, get the fusion uh, of all the sensors together so they can see and understand and position the forces uh, correctly. Along the bottom are the sensors. I grew up in that Aegis detect, control, engage world, so the slide is sort of a little bit different, right? Detecting uh, with a sensors and all, all ranges of them. Uh, space sensors, uh, we have uh, prototypes up there today that will eventually feed uh, the, the hypersonic and ballistic uh, tracking uh, systems that will go on the uh, space uh, development agency's uh, you know, overall uh, national uh, space layer. Um, we have, uh, you, you saw some of them in the video, the uh, sea-based uh, X-band radar. We have ships on our, uh, radars on the ships, you have radars on the ground, uh, a number of them uh, that are fixed sites, many of them uh, mobile and uh, that, that kind of rounds out the overall capability. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a great architecture, and I think it's an extensible architecture, and you can move things, move, move things in, move things out, and have a multi-domain uh, piece as you start to take on a broader and broader threat set. And of course, uh, you know, by my count, Congress has uh, begun to put hypersonic defense, you're the executive agent for that, right. uh, you know, integration, tech authority, uh, somebody's going to take on the cruise missile defense mission. Uh, this is a lot of new missions, and they're different, right? Right. They're, they're, they're all different um, in a lot of ways, uh, but they're, they, they can be very similar, right? And uh, unfortunately, the similarity tends to be in the end game, right, where, where you might eat something, right? And so, so we don't necessarily uh, like that a whole lot. Uh, but your sensor architecture matters, and it, uh, it tends to be different. Uh, for these types of threats. So ballistic uh, sensors are different from might, what might look like uh, you know, a maneuvering hypersonic or a cruise missile that's down low. So you have to account for that. And we have to make investments. Uh, we've been saying it for a while within the Missile Defense Agency. Uh, we have great uh, support within the department. We've got to be in space to deal with the unpredictable nature of how these threats are starting to go, and they're becoming more global. It's no longer such a regional focus. It is, it is global. And so having space capability, the ability to fuse that data, get it down to an engagement uh, capability, that's, that's really the future. 
Why don't we move to the, sure. the issue of space? And I think there's a right. separate slide on that as well. I yeah. uh, wonder if you might kind of give us an update on where where that is for, for this fiscal year and perhaps the right. next fiscal year for the HBTSS system. Right. You also got the, the SCA uh, uh, right. constellation up there right now. But uh, you've talked uh, eloquently many times about the importance of space for this multi-mission. Right. Um, how do you see that proceeding in the next year? Yeah, I think uh, you're going to see a very deliberate uh, stepping out uh, into that area. We, we've talked about it enough. I think we're getting the kind of support uh, that's required within the department and, and on the Hill. So if you can flip the chart, I'm not sure who's doing that. But. Yeah, just just go to the next uh, slide. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, we'll kind of go past the, the mission. We can pop back that if we want. One must, more. I think one more forward. Yeah, there, there it is. A little, little bit hard to read. This is something we've been crafting lately to kind of tell the story on not only the importance of space, but uh, my emphasis back to the team is not only do you find yourself reliant on space when you deploy a system, but you really do have to engineer for it and plan for it. Um, so, you know, if I mentioned detect, control, engage earlier. You have almost a similar sort of thing, you know, up in the galaxy, right? So you have indications and warning. You've got to get to a system that gets you to the tracking uh, sort of quality of data so you can get to fire control. And then you always want to assess uh, whether or not you hit. And that's, uh, you mentioned the space-based uh, kill assessment, which we have deployed today. Uh, we did that a couple years ago. We're, we're on orbit now. Uh, every test that we've had since we got them on orbit, uh, we are we are testing that capability. Uh, we'll continue to integrate that, uh, you know, that phenomenology with what we're getting from terrestrial and, and air-based uh, sensors, and that'll become a more robust capability. And that one on, on the end state, on the far right of the equation, is important because it does allow the combatant commanders and the warfighter to adjust their salvo policy if they know that they've had a very successful uh, first hit. And so off to the left, indications and warning, then it's, uh, it's tracking uh, throughout, and it kind of, again, depends on what your threat space is. And so something called hypersonic blistle uh, ballistic missile uh, tracking uh, sensors will feed into the national sensor layer that the uh, Space Development Agency uh, will, will deploy. Uh, so it all kind of comes together and um, you know, takes you from initial detection all the way to end game and, and kill, which, uh, which is important because we're just sort of out of islands for landing radars. And so there's a big uh, lot of water out there that we, uh, we just can't cover. So the H and the B, the hypersonic and the ballistic uh, letters that uh, HBTSS acronym point to its multi-mission uh, yes. uh, character, and of course also the, the blending of That's these right. missions. Um, right. Are there big impediments on the on the science and technology side to getting that space sensor up? What's what's kind of standing between between us and a space sensor layer? For this yeah, thing? I think the uh, the, the space uh, sensors are. I, I wouldn't call them a new science. Uh, it's it's an engineering effort. So, and we know that there are lots of different commercial options for, for for getting those capabilities up. I would say the big technical one, and if you just think about it for a second, uh, is just dealing with uh, the 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 passing of track data between different space vehicles and maintaining track and dealing with clutter, right? So when you're, when you're up high and you're looking down, uh, there, there is uh, clutter mitigation. Now we know how to go do that, uh, and I don't consider that science either. Uh, so it's really about bringing that all together, knowing what your mission space is, and if it is hypersonics, and if you want to take it a step further and say, well, in some cases I can see cruise missiles, well then, you know, you can leverage the sensors to go do that. So I think it's going to be a great capability. Uh, we just need to, to, to get it up there as soon as we can and uh, rapidly uh, proliferate. Wait. You said something right there along the way. It's not just the, the sensor seeing all this stuff, but in a way it's the bandwidth and the ability to move that data around right. in a prompt and reliable way. That's right. That's uh, right. As quickly as possible, it's going to feed into the architecture. Yeah, and I get to see it in uh, slow motion with my, uh, you know, my Navy background, right? So when we talk about engage on remote, a forward-based sensor, moving that trek data back to a, uh, a shooting uh, platform, for example, that's an example of you know, moving data at, uh, at a very fast rate to make sure that you're closing in on a target that's coming in quickly. Uh, when you put yourself on a moving body that's not at 30 knots, but at a much higher speed, um, you know, maintaining the stability of that track, being able to, to pull the clutter out of it, determining how much you want to process up, uh, on orbit versus how much you want to feed down and process on the ground, and then how you distribute. Do you distribute directly uh, from the sensor? Do you control the weapon from space? Or do you take it to the ground station and do it there? there there's, uh, there's different trades, and we'll probably do it differently in a lot of different ways because that adds to the overall resilience of the system. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've got a, a thousand other things, but I want to open it up to questions for the next 20 minutes okay. or so. And uh, we've got a mic, a couple mics that are, are going around. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, get, get my attention. We'll bring you the mic. Please identify yourself and uh, keep it in the form of a, of a question. Uh, let's go to this gentleman uh, right here in the middle.
Thank you for my attending question. My name is Sang Minnie. I'm working for the Radio Free Asia for Korean service. I have a question about North Korean missile threat. Uh, North Korea claimed that they successfully launched submarine ballistic missile last week. But do you think that, do you assess that they really uh, successfully launched submarine ballistic missile or do you assess that they uh, launched some missile from sea-based platform? And also if they are really successfully the SLVM, how do you assess their capability of SLVM by North Korea? All right, so the question is, uh, you know, what, what's your take on the reported SLVM test from last, uh, last week, what it means for us? Yeah, so, so I would say that, uh, you know, it's really kind of a, more of a question for the intelligence community. It's not something, you know, I'm, I'm really an acquisition guy, right? I, I go build systems, but I will tell you that, you know, what you saw in, in the press, let's just assume that it is a, a submarine launch. I, I've also read that it may have been some underwater barge. You know, I don't, I don't know what it is, um, but um, I, I also have high faith in uh, the U.S. and the, uh, the allied uh, submarine forces that if something like that were to emerge over time, that we'd be able to hold it back. Um, so um, I'm, I'm less concerned about the platform. Uh, I think it's, but the, the message to take from that is they are trying lots of different ways to not only launch, but to deliver uh, that kind of capability. And so we need to keep an eye on it uh, and continuing to assess that to make sure the architecture is in place to deal with it. All right, I think we got this gentleman right here. My name's Kevin Smith. Uh, thank you for today. And uh, I wanted to ask you, the role of um, automation in this process. Yeah. When something's launched and we gotta shoot it out of the sky, yeah. that all happens very quickly. And so what's kind of the role of, um, yeah, what, which processes can be automated? What's the role of artificial intelligence if, to the extent you can speak about it? Yeah, it's, um, you almost can't swing a dead cat without hitting someone with AI printed on their forehead. Um, it, it's an important part of the future and it's an important part of now. And I would say that if you look back 15, 20 years in a lot of our weapon systems, you see um, artificial intelligence there, you know, where, where it was in that time in its evolution. It doesn't relieve you of the responsibility of properly engineering the fire control loop, right? So your ability to speed it up and take human error out of the loop uh, is, is good and it's important. And I think you're right uh, with the kind of speeds that we're dealing with today, the kind of reaction time that we have to have today, there's no other answer other than to leverage artificial intelligence. But again, it doesn't relieve you from the responsibility of doing the full fire control engineering. Um, you just gotta uh, figure out where's the right place for uh, artificial intelligence. If you look at a lot of the systems today that run in automatic or in semi-automatic or in manual, that's sort of the early, that, that's the early view of artificial intelligence. And so uh, if the, the problem we're trying to solve really is pretty much always reaction time. So what can you do to speed up reaction time? But uh, the balance there is how often do you and must you have an operator in the loop just given the rules of engagement? So can't, can't forget that. Okay, all right, I think we've got this gentleman up in the front waiting here. It's coming. Thank you, I'm uh, <coughs> Dong Yeon Kim from Voice America Korean Service. I have a question uh, regarding the GSOMIA. Uh, these, uh, with uh, South Korea uh, deciding not to uh, extend the GSOMIA with Japan. How, how does that uh, affect the missile defense operation in, in the over, uh, overall perspective? And the second is, you said uh, about integration of data. How, but like, unlike Japan, South Korea is not uh, integrated with the missile defense. What is your concern on that? aspect. Thank you. I didn't quite catch well, well, we've got our, our bilateral relation with both Korea and Japan. Right. The question is whether the Jisomia, you know, uh, suspension will affect that or if we are actually still in a good place with our information sharing with all our allies. Yeah, so it's obviously uh, you want as much uh, free exchange, you know, if, if you get down to the data perspective, uh, let's just say you're sharing sensor data, you want to have as much unfettered, uh, you know, sharing as possible so that you can leverage the whole force. Uh, can you operate in a world to where there's a bilateral between the U.S., Japan, and the U.S. and uh, the ROK? You could do that. Uh, it's not optimal. Um, so, yes, I would love to live in a world to where uh, both Japan and South Korea can come through their differences and we can, you know, open up the, the data to, to openly share with them. But there are obviously ways to work around it. The capabilities in, in the Japanese Navy, for example, for ballistic missile defense and what's in the uh, uh, Republic of Korea's uh, arsenal uh, from a naval perspective, they're, they're different anyway. Um, so given those differences, there's probably a minor effect today. But once they get on parity, uh, then it becomes a larger issue in terms of data sharing. 
Good. All right. I think we've got a gentleman right here, and then we'll go back. Drake Avila, Asia Policy Point. Um, in the layered missile defense system, how do later layers react if an earlier layer is compromised? Specifically, if um, satellite capabilities are neutralized, how do land and sea sensors adjust, and how is their efficiency impaired? Thank you. Yeah, so, so we, uh, we war game that a lot, and, uh, and I would say that uh, the systems are built to always assume that they have the direct attack coming on them, right? So if you're a Patriot battery in a, in a layered architecture, you're going to always assume that there's either a leaker or everything's coming at you and that you have to try it at all, right? So uh, we really build it from the opposite direction from the way you described it. So if you have Patriot, well then we're gonna have that, we're gonna have Aegis, we're gonna have GMD, depending on what that uh, sense of layering uh, looks like. The best place though to get a look at that is to war game those sorts of scenarios, which we do on a regular basis. Uh, Northcom does that, Stratcom does it. Uh, you, you you see our regional command commanders doing that based on the assets that they have uh, available to them. Um, and um, I think it just varies depending on what the scenario is, but um, we do have the ability to leverage different parts of the layer depending on where you might lose something, and we drill on that all the time. It's all part of the warfighters being prepared to operate the system. You know, on that point, uh, one of the uh, sort of favorite criticisms of MDA is the question of operational realism. Uh, and you've spent a lot of time on this. You're very uh, focused on warfighter integration, uh, warfighter involvement, and, and all this kind of stuff. How do you see the agency uh, maturing on the operational realism side? Yeah, I think that um, you know one, one of the things we talk about when you say operational realism, everyone right away goes to a test like the FTG-11, and they think about a live fire test. Um, there is a whole host of ground tests that we do and associated uh, warfighter integration tests that tie to those. And so uh, you, you can't really get to a flight test without a full ground test campaign, under, you know, with full high fidelity modeling all the way through with a close in tie with the warfighters on how they're going to go off and engage these. Yet we talked earlier about the space-based kill assessment. So SCA is not fully operational today, uh, but they're up there operating, which means we can capture that data. And where we are now is working very closely with the warfighters to determine what they need to see. You know, what, what is that uh, user interface that is desired as, as we have this system now deployed? And so we're working our way through that. Um, I mentioned the touch points at C2BMC where the operators are on the console. Um, so they're not just doing it during a flight test or during a ground test, but every day. And so when you have uh, launches out there, uh, you know, we, we have our operators on, on duty right now that when there's another launch like that, we'll determine whether or not we're violating a, uh, a defended area and we're going to either go on alert or not, right? Sometimes we manually go just, just to test the system and then we bring it back down. And so that's happening on ships today. It's happening in the various batteries. It happens in the uh, GMD uh, fire control. Um, so when it comes to realism, uh, the fact that we've got uh, sailors deployed on those ships today, you got the, you know, our soldiers uh, up at Fort Greeley, we have the airmen and all the different radars deployed around the world, uh, they're ready to go and we'll pull in those operational teams. One of our last um, Aegis tests on Aegis Ashore, we actually brought in the Romania team to sit on the console and operate hmm. uh, there in cool. Hawaii. Kind of cool, right? Freaks everybody out when you bring Romanians into Hawaii, but it was great. <laughs> great. All right, we got a question right here. Thanks. Good morning, sir. John morning. Vaughn from uh, Raytheon <laughs> Company. Warren Tom. Uh, sir, can you speak at all to the uh, MDR response for THAAD FIREC units uh, number required, and then also uh, progress you're making on the program transfer with the Army? Oh, boy. Uh, so I've got to hold them back and talk yeah. about transfer. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I think you asked about uh, the uh, Missile Defense Review's uh, task for the Army to determine numbers of batteries, and then I think you asked about transfer. Uh, so so I'll, I'll, I'll tell a, a bad story. First, I'm not going to tell you the number in this environment today, but the Army did do its analysis uh, against a, uh, a very valid uh, threat set, and they have a number, and that number has been briefed out. And in fact, we closed out that action uh, recently. The Army will continue to assess uh, as the threat changes or increases, and then we'll know what that, uh, that number is. Um, when it comes to transfer, um, we, uh, we, it's, it remains kind of a debate, uh, both within the building and on the Hill, and, and I think that's okay. Um, as a, a new director, you know, four months sitting in the chair, having stared at this a lot and had lots of debates with prior directors about whether or not uh, we need to transfer or not, I, I kind of drew, drew my own conclusion, uh, which irritated a few people on the Hill recently. Uh, hey, how can you say this? The last two directors have said that. I'm like, well, because I've taken a harder look at it. And for me, it fundamentally comes down to what does it mean to transfer? 
right? So when we say transfer, everyone's got a different definition. It's either at production of, say, a missile system, we'll just stick with that, right? It's, it's either the interceptors, or it's to take on, well, the battery level. The Army should just own the batteries. Or the Army should own the associated radars. Those are the TPY-2s that are not only part of terminal mode, but a part of the homeland defense architecture. So when we start having those kind of conversations, I immediately go back and say, let's define transfer the way it should be defined, which is operations and sustainment with a cost share with the agency to provide sustainment support. And why does that make sense? It's because it applies to every system we've ever built. So I mentioned GMD for a reason, running into the Army guys up there, right? Both on console and providing security forces and running the BOQ, right? Uh, go to clear, airmen up there operating the radar. I mean, that's an operations and sustainment role that the services do very well to include getting the manning in place. The Army for Thad, They've manned up the batteries. They have the eighth battery manned, for example, right? We're just equipment poor right now. Um, so I think we have a very successful story. If you define transfer correctly, if you muck around with the definition for whatever the agenda is, then the story goes haywire and it doesn't apply to all systems. But all systems, when you define lead service as operating and sustaining and the agency providing the right sustainment support is the right answer. The debate I'd like to have is, are we doing the right things as an agency to provide the right logistics, the right training? And I'll just use my Aegis story. Am I doing enough to ensure a sub on an Aegis ship is at the highest level it can be for the ballistic missile defense mission? Or, or am I being held accountable to that? That's the conversation I want to have, not the conversation of an organizational experiment in this strategic environment. That's the wrong answer. Am I providing the right training to the Aegis Training and Readiness Center? Are there deficits there that we should be addressing and fixing? That's the, that's the conversation I want to have. You know, what does my cost share look like? I can show you that. But should I do an organizational experiment and carve out production of a missile of a major system like that that we need to continue to, to keep steady? And I mentioned dynamic force employment with the Army. Why would we do an organizational experiment in this environment today? Um, I'd rather talk about sparing do the soldiers have what they need to operate the system. Does that answer it? I was getting a little too excited there, sorry about that. Chris Shank is smiling at me. <laughs> well, it's funny, I mean, it's really only talked about for, for TB, TB2, THAAD, and SM, not GMD, as you emphasize. Yeah. Uh, but this really suggests, I mean, again, back to the mission set, right. uh, you could have unintended consequences by carving things off rather than having everything more fully sure integrated. Could. Yeah, and I think about the USFK Gion uh, work that's happening out uh, in the ROK and its extensibility to other theaters. I think about the Saudi case, a major FMS case, you know, it took a decade to pull that together. Why would you muck with that? You know, that's going to allow us to get the production lines back up, uh, lower the cost of interceptors going to the U.S. forces. Why would we mess with that? Uh, and it's, it's really, um, it's, it's just playing around with the definition that is well understood. Great, so. great. All right, who else? Right here in the, in the front. Admiral Dave McFarland, how are you? Hey, stranger, how are you? A quick question. So I'm looking at the slide up here, and I see a lot of lightning bolts, and I see a bunch of sensors and right. information transport, and I see attack operations, but I don't see cybersecurity. Can you talk to us about that? Sure. Yeah, and in fact, um, I don't have the slide in this package. If you were to ask me about uh, the changes that need to be made within the Missile Defense Agency for the future, I will mention the evolved ballistic threat. I will talk about hypersonic, I will talk about cruise missile, and I talk about cybersecurity. They, they go together. And so how do you organize for that, right? Something that cuts across everything. And so I've had some great discussions with Dr. Crossweight from DOT&E about uh, do I need a functional code for cybersecurity? It's embedded in all the programs today. You can go look at our, our budget exhibits and you can see it across all the programs. But is it coordinated at the level that it needs to be coordinated for war fighting, right? Uh, can you get by with a, a Napoleon's corporal is what uh, Dr. Crossway calls it, where you have someone that's on direct report for me that kind of keeps his, his hands and eyes on what the different uh, parts of the agency are doing. And it's a big, big problem, as you know, uh, whether it's your administrative networks or it's the operational networks or if it's, you know, within the fire control loop on a ship someplace. It's, it's a big issue. And so we do need to get our arms around it and organize for it. I, I would say that we're, we're not task-based organized on it today, not task organized to, to execute that as a war fighting capability and that's that's where I want to take the agency over the next few months so it's not the same as cyber but and sometimes they're, they're put together but electronic attack and yeah. the whole electromagnetic spectrum right I don't think we've kind of brought up directed energy much 
And perhaps right. you could kind of speak to the EMS, and, but also sure. different kinds of directed energy in your portfolio. Yeah, in some ways, when I, when I show the prior chart, I do that on purpose just to irritate people because it's clearly a kinetic chart, right? And it's clearly missile on missile. Um, and there's, because that's what we can talk about in this environment. A lot of the things that you just mentioned, you know, reside, reside elsewhere. And so it can't have a robust discussion there. I would say that what we're doing for directed energy is taking a holistic department uh, look within uh, MDA. Our, the work that we do in laser scaling, for example, is tapped into Dr. Tom Carr, who's the head for direct energy up on the R&E staff, into an overall DOD roadmap. And I think it's important to, to pool resources and work together on that because it is a very enabling technology that we need, not only for warfighting, you can use it for sensing, you can use it for a lot of different things. And so we're, we're, we're clutched in on a DOD roadmap, and that's where our investments, I think two years ago, I would have come in here and talked to you about very high power levels operating at very high altitudes. We, we've kind of just stepped away from that and said, let's pool the resources sources across the department to get to higher power levels and get to smaller space and weight because everyone needs it. It's not just the Missile Defense Agency. If something we're working on today within the agency um, goes to a service and not used in the Missile Defense Mission, I'm okay with that. Okay, good. Well, we've got another, all right, let's do in the back. Morning, sir. Thank you for the call, for the talk. Uh, this is Harry Chen from Radio Free Asia, China Mandarin Service. And uh, during the latest uh, military parade that China CPC is founding 70th anniversary, the PLA actually displaced a few new models of missiles. And I wonder what's your assessment on their capability right now, and how the U.S. trying to respond to that? Thank you. Yeah. So um, I always think parades are fun. Uh, but but, but I, I, do, I do leave it to the intelligence agency to kind of assess uh, what we have there. Um, I, I really don't have a lot of commentary other than, uh, you know, hey, happy 70th anniversary. And uh, it's the 15th anniversary of GMD. <laughs> All right. Um, so let me just sort of take a, a look forward here as we, as we conclude. And that's, you know, in, as we begin to put together the 21 budget, uh, you've got a lot of new missions coming down the pipe. Yeah. What are some some top priorities that kind of, especially cut across the missions? You spoke very nicely about kind of the, the specific role of the Missile Defense Agency in this larger ecosystem and kind of some ways to think about the, the, uh, the enterprise and, and transfer and all that, but, but what are some big priorities, your priorities, for moving forward to, to tackle all of these things? Yeah, so, so I think um, the, the way to address that the best, and this is kind of how we're coming at it from an organizational perspective and how we even deal with 70th, 70th anniversary parades, is you, you got to look at where the threat is, where it is today, where it's going in the future. So it kind of starts on that left-hand side. And then you have to take a look at the pointy end is, what do the warfighters need? And when I think about the numbers of threats and where they're going, and I look at what the warfighters need, to me it's about the multi-domain uh, act. Right? It's unusual for most programs to kind of work beyond their scope, but I think we're nuts if we don't. Right? So if we don't open up the spigot for C2, BMC, our command and control battle management to bring in air breathing threats, for example, that could help the Navy do its mission. If we don't leverage a radar that is on an island that can also look up and do space situational awareness and get that data to who could use it, or have the radar look down for surface tracks on the ocean and pass that to the Navy. We are missing an opportunity. And in general, you don't have to do a lot of new requirements onto those assets. You can just leverage the inherent capability that they've got. And so for me, it's about exploring the capability of the systems that are out there to kind of push them to the edge. We talked about SM3 it was not designed to go against an ICBM but there's some inherent capability there that we see in our modeling, so why not go explore that and go do a flight test? Someone earlier mentioned that that's a capacity to maybe do that, also not designed to get that threat, but may have capability there in some unique circumstances. And so if you understand where all those capabilities and limitations are across the system, whether it's a sensor or a fire control, how it can tie in and support all the services and even non-DOD uh, partners in terms of sensing and the kind of data that you have, I think uh, we're moving in the direction that we need to move into. So that, that's probably my, my broad answer, uh, Tom. And uh, I, I can go down to well, another level. Let me level. just take another level, and that is you sure. know, the relative trade-offs between uh, procurement, sustainment, and R&D, yeah. true R&D within, uh, within the agency. Is, as these new missions come online, is there going to have to be a, a little bit of a, a shift there? 
uh, could, could be. And so, so the way we uh, normally uh, characterize our budget uh, is along the priorities of the agency. I didn't really get into those earlier, right? But the first one really is a readiness and sustainment uh, priority. And that nominally was about 60%. And then 30% went into capability and capacity, which was buying more things. And we said we had this 10% down there focused on the advanced threat. And so that's kind of how we bucketize our budget. Now, when I go in and I listen to the Navy give its palm brief or the Air Force or the Army, it's kind of interesting, right? 60% going towards readiness and sustainment, because that's a hard, hard problem, right? And then 30% towards buying new things and 10 towards a threat. Um, we took a look at it as we as we're walking into this next uh, budget phase and saying, well, maybe that's not, maybe those numbers aren't, maybe we're not bucketizing things in the right place, right? So if I'm really going to focus in on readiness and sustainment and, and take some of the things that were previously put into that part of the bucket that are really addressing the advanced threat, that sort of changes the ratio. Yeah. And so we're, we're going to take a different look at how we uh, look at the advanced threat, for example, because when we first uh, had our alignment under the Undersecretary for R&E, we sort of had science and technology in our minds which meant anything that was at the component and element level of technology maturation was put into that 10% bucket, which is why it's 10%. But if you actually say this is about the threat, and I'm doing, say, an Aegis upgrade to deal with the threat, or a THAAD upgrade, or I'm doing a next generation interceptor, that's actually down in that other bucket. So I still think there are, it's a valid way to break up the program as opposed to homeland and regional. Look at it from what am I sustaining today, what am I actually producing and delivering right now, and what am I working on for the future, you get sort of a different view of the program. And, um, and it does force you to kind of think about warfighter more often. All right. Well, Admiral, thank you for, for your time. The yeah, agency's you, in good, time, uh, good hands, and I appreciate you coming out. Well, I appreciate the time. Thanks, everybody. So we're going to take a, a quick 10-minute break, coffee break outside, and then we'll come back for our next panel. Okay, great. All right.
second part uh, of this morning's uh, conference. Again, I'm Tom Carrico. Uh, we had a good conversation with uh, Admiral Hill this morning, kind of talking about his vision and intent. And one thing we've been wanting to do for a while is to uh, put together a, uh, a panel of industry to kind of talk about uh, what's, what's out there, what we should be thinking about, what challenges and opportunities uh, uh, should be uh, considered for the, for the whole missile defense, for the growing missile defense uh, enterprise. And so we've got uh, a good representation here uh, of, of different uh, perspectives. And so we've got, to my immediate left, uh, uh, Paul Smith, uh, who is the Vice President and Program Director uh, for the GMD pro program at, uh, at Boeing, where he's been for about 17 years. To his left is uh, Sarah Reeves, who's the Vice President of Missile Defense Programs at Lockheed Martin Space out in uh, Sunnyvale. Uh, next up is uh, uh, retired uh, Brigadier General Ken Todorov, who's the Vice President of Missile Defense Solutions for Northrop, Northrop Grumman Corporation. And then for, uh, Mitch Stevenson, Dr. Mitch Stevenson, uh, who is the uh, Vice President for Raytheon Missile Systems uh, at in uh, Tucson, uh, Arizona. And then finally, John Schumacher, uh, who is the Senior Vice President uh, for Washington Operations uh, here in Washington for uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne. So why don't we uh, go in the, the order uh, provided or the order you all are sitting in, uh, starting with you, Paul, and talk a little bit about uh, uh, Boeing's perspective, GMD, and uh, how you kind of see uh, what Admiral Hill talked about and the opportunities for, for all that uh, that you Sure. Got. Thanks, Tom. I guess a bit of a tactical mistake sitting uh, directly <laughs> to your left here to get started, but that's all, that's all right. Thanks for the opportunity to come out and talk about uh, opportunities and challenges uh, in the area of the future of missile defense. Obviously, it, very important topic right now. There's a, a tremendous amount going on. I suspect that about half of you in the audience are engineers, and engineers love to talk about technologies and where we're headed in that regard. Kind of tough to do that in an open forum. So I thought uh, what I would uh, focus on a little bit more, and I hope our discussion today can focus on, are some of the challenges uh, that we perceive going forward uh, for uh, missile defense. I would throw out uh, just a couple that, that I think are important and that I hope we can talk about uh, today. One would be the sort of dynamic between the need for agility and what everyone's uh, taken to calling speed of relevance and uh, risk tolerance on programs, particularly our development uh, programs and how we balance uh, the tolerance between those two. And I think that would be an important discussion. The other would be deciding between uh, the fundamental approaches we use to bring new capability on board, an evolutionary or a spiral type approach versus a uh, uh, leap forward sort of silver bullet type approach. And I think those are uh, topics that we should engage in uh, a bit today. I'm sure there are others, but those would be two that, that uh, come to mind for me. Uh, in terms of my thinking about those, there are a few precepts that I think should apply to uh, how we approach the future of, uh, of uh, uh, missile defense. I think first, um, in my mind, there's sort of no silver bullet that's going to uh, be able to take care of everything. And, and I think that's pretty obvious with respect to uh, the threat. It's multi-domain, uh, it's dynamic, it's ever-evolving. And we're living in an age of, of absolute tremendous technology development and explosion. And I think the ability for technology to disrupt both uh, our thought process from a defensive, defensive posture and the adversary's thought process from a defensive uh, posture are so great that they would argue that we need to, uh, uh, to uh, develop a little, uh, test a little, field a little, uh, and move forward. A second uh, precept that I think is important is that uh, I, we should be building strength on strength. Uh, if you look back at the history of the, of the Missile Defense Agency and some of the stellar programs that have really come of age now, programs like THAAD and Patriot, uh, the Aegis program, where we now know that a, a developed capability uh, that uh, the tremendous intelligence and, and passion of uh, men and women of this nation, nation have made happen are, are out there now. They're trustable, they're deployable, they're extensible. I would argue that uh, the ground-based mid-course defense program, uh, based on the last four flight tests, and particularly flight test 11, uh, have uh, demonstrated that that system now uh, is a re reliable and extensible system. And we should be building strength on those strengths. How can we continue to innovate around those capabilities and extend them uh, uh, as opposed to uh, fundamentally uh, starting over with systems? So I think that's a, that's a key point. I'm much more of an advocate in sort of uh, weapon system integration innovation than I am necessarily with a, uh, a full-on uh, leap forward, uh, complete change to a program. I think also we need to be taking a very disciplined approach to uh, uh, development uh, in the agency and, and, and in industry. 
Uh, so often we, we see that next shiny object and we think that that's great, let's, let's get that uh, in the system. We need to make sure that in every instance we are moving from threat to mission capability to decomposed architecture, assigning functionality to the right elements of, uh, of the capability before we move into design. And I, we, we need to remember that precept at all times. Otherwise, we run the risk of developing capabilities that are suboptimized uh, for the entire mission. And uh, I, I want to make sure that, the, that we all think about that and talk about that a little bit together. A fourth precept is the importance of design margin in our development. I, uh, I often, uh, we get into a program, and I'll just, we'll talk about RKV for just a second. You know, it stings a little bit, right, that, uh, that we didn't complete that program. One of the fundamental problems with the program was that, it, as conceived, it really didn't have a whole lot of design margin. So when things, uh, uh, issues came up during the development process, there wasn't a, a lot uh, left um, to, to be able to resolve those, those problems. We were on a diet from the from the day the program started. And I think it's so important that we develop margin in our designs at the get-go to do two things. One is to fend against uh, the realities that will happen during design development that we need to be able to account uh, for. And two, to ensure that our programs have extensibility. Uh, no one would have envisioned that the B-52 bomber that's uh, been in service for over 50 years would be, would be uh, having uh, a carrier-based uh, uh, cruise missiles on it, uh, you know, rotary, rotary launch or cruise missiles on it, but it can because the fundamental uh, integrity and, and margin that that aircraft has allowed that continued extensibility. So I think that's an important thing to talk about. And finally, uh, I think it's very important as we bring new technologies into programs that we focus on uh, the specific thing that we're trying to get at and not cobble uh, up uh, a particular technology we're trying to develop with other things that might be related to it. Uh, a key area that I think that is going to be important in is the, the whole space sensing layer. You know, a, a, the kind of sensor we're looking for is not the same as the kind of sensor that's going to work well for the intelligence community. We can't necessarily conflate those two and we need to be very focused on the particular technology we're trying to get fielded and crawl, walk, run toward that. So kind of a long introduction, Tom, but I think those are some of the areas that I, I'd love to see the, the group talk about today. Great, well, I, I'd certainly like to come back to a couple of things, including the design margin thing, but let's go to Sarah. Sarah, you've got a lot of things in your portfolio, everything from THAAD to space sensors to directed energy. Uh, what's your perspective on, on all this and where you see things going? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, I, I, first of all, I want to say uh, I thought Vice Admiral's comments and his vision are, are really spot on. Um, I, I'll say um, I think we have a really strong missile defense shield right now, um, and it's very capable, very precise, and we really just need to add some new tools into that missile defense shield in order to address advanced threat. So um, in particular, I think there are three things that we really need to focus on. and. And uh, Vice Admiral Hill spoke about that today. One, the first is we really need a space layer that's going to handle the advanced threat. He talked about the difference between ballistic threat trajectories and, and the um, advanced threats and their unpredictability. So in particular, we have to have a very integrated space layer that allows us to keep track custody and, and deliver that information to the shooters. The second thing um, is we need to have the better integration, multi-domain fusion of data. Uh, so C2BMC uh, was referenced as well. Uh, tremendously capable system today uh, and very good uh, capability to evolve that to the future. And uh, so some of the aspects of that include increasing the, the timeline for um, our warfighters and for the decisions to be made as these timelines get faster and faster. And one of the ways you do that is machine to machine learning, uh, machine to machine uh, interfaces. And so again, I think that these are smaller steps. They're not super high risk in order to get to a hypersonic defense shield. And then thirdly, uh, we do have some great THAAD uh, weapon systems, Aegis weapon systems, uh, GMD, from which we, we have a basic architecture and we can go ahead and evolve those systems by putting in more agile KVs, by um, making sure that we're looking at different phases of flight besides terminal that we can um, go after and attack these advanced threats. So really those are the three items that I think that um, we should fo focus on and it's such a great time to be in this um, um, 
inflection point where we can really shape the future of missile defense. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ken, uh, over to you, of course, you were also the Deputy Director of MDA, so you've got the operational uh, experience as well. Over to you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for putting this together, and uh, it's been a great morning so far. I agree with my colleagues so far on a lot of things they've said. I think the biggest challenge for us in this industry or this enterprise going forward is just the sheer nature of the way the threat has changed. And I just like to call it diversity of the threat. You know, not that it was ever easy, but it seems to be getting more and more challenging. I mean, the Admiral had the slide today talking specifically about the space, but if you just look at that slide and you see the complexities of the things that we're trying to solve, and no longer just ballistic. Now you add the hypersonic challenge to it. You add cruise missile threats to it. You add the air breathing threats that are out there. It's more and more this sort of space or this weapon space or mission space is getting increasingly complex. And that presents a challenge for all of us who are involved in trying to solve the problems and, and, and help the nation out and help our customers out. There's a couple ways I think that we're, our perspective uh, at North of Grumman, we're trying to take a look at this from not necessarily a new perspective, but maybe a different perspective. And one is how do you fold in, it was mentioned one of the comments this morning to the Admiral, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning. I agree with the Admiral certainly when he says, you know, the man or the woman in the loop will never be replaced. But how can we use those decision aids to make the battle space more understandable? Uh, those kinds of technologies have to be in the forefront of our thinking of where we go. That's sort of my first point and some of the things we're focused on. The second is how do we fold digital into this equation? You know, digital systems that are maybe, yeah, it's, it's always gonna be about the hardware, but how does the software define that hardware that enables the capability? And so I think that's increasingly important as we see this battle space and the complexity of that space change. You have to design and develop systems that are adaptable and changeable to the future. So that goes away from maybe how we used to do things back in the day where there was these long lead times and you set a requirements and you design and you build toward the capability, now once, you know, if you, if you were to go with that sort of construct, once you feel the capability, it's almost, I don't want to say obsolete, but I dare say it's, it's certainly not going to be as responsive as we need to, given the way that threat is adapting. So how do we have digital facing systems that can change? How does uh, software and the development of software uh, come into play here? Certainly, again, going to always be about the hardware, but, but thinking about the software certainly at the, at the, at the get-go I think is very important. And then the third point I just raised is sort of the level of cooperation between us and our organizations, not only us on the stage, but all of industry, uh, and away from proprietary and stovepipe kinds of things. I think there has to be uh, somehow we have to break through those barriers and, and our willingness to work more closely together on things is going to be increasingly important. No one of our organizations has the ability to solve it all. I think we're stronger together. We got to figure out ways to do that better and more efficiently. And, um, and work with our customer and the government as well, open up that dialogue. So those are kind of the three things that I kind of wanted to touch on today and I look forward to the discussion. All right, Mitch, we got some good uh, attention to the SM3 from the Admiral this morning. Yeah, we were, uh, uh, I think the Raytheon folks in the room were very proud on a lot of the things that the Admiral said, but you know, I, I'm glad you started there because I, I, before we get into what we think the future is, uh, I want us to take a moment because when the Admiral was up here, he talked about some of his mentors and things that uh, was said. You know, we, we all have to, in the missile defense construct, realize that we still stand on the shoulders of a lot of giants that, that were before us. Uh, this evolution that has been created uh, very successfully, you heard Paul and, and the, the other uh, folks up here talk about those things that have been created that we're building upon now. We can't forget that legacy that we've had. Although, I think, you know, from a Raytheon perspective, you know, number one, Ken very well par uh, pointed out partnership is an important part of what we're looking at for the future. We, we know we can't do everything. We believe we have some key components. Uh, we're very proud of what SM3 has been able to do. We just celebrated the 400th delivery of an SM3, uh, which is a remarkable feat that I don't believe anybody 10 years ago would have believed we would be achieving today. Uh, foundationally, Standard Missile is a 60-year-old franchise for Raytheon, and the evolution of that system, you heard the Admiral talk a little bit about SM6 and the capabilities that exist inherently inside of the evolution of that missile uh, has presented a lot of uh, opportunities for us to do things uh, that we never believed that we could do before. But, but foundationally, from a Raytheon standpoint, um, you know, we agree with what Paul articulated the RKV story very, very well. Uh, but we learned a lot from that. I think Paul and the team will agree that we all learned a lot. It, it stings, it still stings, but foundationally we're better off than we were before. But I would say for any new program coming, this is a risk that we all have to be aware of. For any new program coming, 
if more requirements, if we're going to do a 10-year new program, any new requirements that come in, we run the risk of, uh, of being up against our requirements that we can't meet if we don't understand right off the bat what the threat is likely to do in the next 10 years, which is a hard thing to gauge. Uh, but, but again, we want to look at aggregation, innovation, uh, and, and ultimately uh, in integration uh, in what we're doing. You know, so there's a lot inherent in the system now that we got to look at that we now consider to be almost separate parts of the system that we got to figure out how to aggregate together. We talked a little bit this morning about the fact that should we be talking about regional and, and homeland in separate uh, venues, uh, or should we be looking at those more as a closed venue? So that aggregation is an important part of what we need to look at as a team. You know, secondly, the innovation part of what uh, we all are very capable of doing and we've all been able to bring to the game. We've got to continue to do that. The threat is moving very, very quickly, and it's not any longer about being paced by the threat. The threat is pacing us, and that's not a place that we want to be. We, gotta, we got to be in a position to innovate, to leapfrog the threat and uh, get back ahead of them. And then finally, the, the integration piece. So when I say the integration piece, it's not necessarily system integration that I'm talking about. There is many breakthrough technologies that we are now discovering that we have to be agile enough to get integrated into the system to be able to do that leapfrog effort uh, in, uh, in the context that I just spoke about. So, so really from a Raytheon perspective, we really are trying to focus on ag aggregating what we have now, uh, working with our partners, again, that's key to doing that. And you see some successes there that the Admiral talked about this morning. Uh, secondly, to innovate, and then lastly, to integrate the technologies that we see evolving on our side. All right, lots there. I'm gonna pull a couple of those threads later, but I'm gonna let you, uh, John go up uh, first. There we go. It's a, thanks, Tom, and uh, thank you for putting this together. I would just share, first off, it's great for Aerojet, who's really a supplier to all the primes, the leaders of the primes that are sitting here. Great privilege for us to get to be on this panel, so thank you for that. Um, and the perils of being last, I agree with everything everyone said, I was going to say a few of them. So um, what I'd focus on, though, is really what uh, Admiral Hill touched on about inflection point, uh, which Sarah mentioned, but also um, the design, looking at the design, taking a fresh look at design as we go across, and certainly as a propulsion provider, we, come, we do propulsion and advanced warheads, and we often find that, and, and quite honestly, when I was uh, at NASA or DOD or uh, at a prime, sometimes propulsion is taken as a commodity and, and the requirements are set and then you come in. If you put propulsion and some of the advanced capabilities you might want in the, design, in the uh, requirements phase into design, and then look across that whole spectrum from design, R&D, then manufacturing ability, producibility, um, might come up with some um, novel things. And we've had great success working with everyone here on different aspects of that. So really, as we go forward, very much look to do that. Um, and you know, with propulsion, we have the great uh, fortune of doing both liquid and solid propulsion and decades of experience. And you, you find that bringing those experts together from both sides you come up with some very novel solutions, whether it be for a ship-based system, land-based system, what do you want to do on speed, distance, survivability, maneuverability, all those factors. And then you come to the cost aspect of it. The earlier we get in um, and the earlier we come into and know there's a slew of different requirements to be met, but really you can come give some novel solutions. And we as a company have spent the last five years really um, transforming to be much leaner, more state-of-the-art facilities, so we can really act quickly on this whole design design, and through the producibility that I think Admiral Hill's looking for, I think everyone here on this panel is looking for us on. So very exciting time, really look forward to working with everyone on that and, and hopefully helping to bring some real innovation right up front in the requirements design phase and then through to some very cost effective manufacturing at the other end. All right, well there's a lot we put on the table. I'm gonna try to pull a couple threads together from what everybody said. Uh, and uh, I'll, everybody kind of alluded to this in, in one way or another, but next generation interceptor, that's the big uh, elephant in the room at, at the moment. Uh, Mitch, you, I think you were kind of alluding to that when you said, you know, if we get into some big 10-year program, make sure that the uh, future requirements creep and this kind of thing doesn't slow us down. Paul, you talked about the, the importance of spirals. You know, looking back over the past, let's just say 15 years for, for some of these programs, some of the, that spiraling that was hoped for doesn't always kind of manifest itself after all. And so, okay, staying focused on, on NGI, how do we, 
what, what are your perspectives on how to, to build in that, that margin that you talked about, Paul, uh, and to make sure that this is, if it's a big program for 10 years, that it doesn't kind of chase the wrong thing, and that it builds in enough margin and an ability to, to adapt so that 10 years from now, there's something there that's useful. Yeah, it, I think it's one of the core issues that uh, we need to deal with. I, uh, as Mitch mentioned, and those of you that have had the advantage of uh, rece receiving and reading the draft RFPs know that the, the threat that this uh, program is being developed for is real. We have got to get onto it. It's not, there's no question that uh, the adversary's capabilities are, are increasing and, and we've absolutely got to be looking at uh, how uh, we defend against them. The question really is how do you go about doing that? So if you at the onset envision what you think the adversary's capability is going to be 10 years from now when this capability would be fielded, you use your best crystal ball and you try to envelope that in the best way you can and certainly this uh, uh, draft uh, uh, solicitation is attempting to do that. But imagine yourself at a preliminary design review 18 months from now or later and uh, the reality of uh, techno technological disruption has come to pass and the adversary can do something else. Are we in fact going to then sort of restart uh, and does the 10 year uh, horizon become a 12 year horizon? That, that's one of the dynamics I think you have to be concerned with. So the idea in my mind is that we need to be looking at advancing the technologies that are going to be necessary to defeat that advancing threat and then infusing those as they become uh, relevant and available as opposed to trying to solve the whole thing in one in one fell swoop and I think that's a that's a difficult uh, dynamic but it's it's what we're faced with yeah I mean I Paul uh, you know he, he said it very well I, I, I one of my biggest fears it, it, you have to start defining a requirement by you know looking at where we were 10 years ago there was no real hypersonic threat that we were fearful of. Um, the cruise missile capabilities were rudimentary compared to what they are now. Um, you know, we were, we were looking at expansion of the ballistic threat with countermeasures and other things of that nature. And now here we are 10 years later and we're dealing with a totally different missile defense construct. A totally different uh, construct. If we believe uh, as the experts tell us that technology is moving exponentially and we are, you know, as Paul said, 50% of us are probably engineers and so we can do the math. Um, what makes us think that in 10 years from now the requirements today are going to even marginally encapsulate what the threat's going to be capable of doing? With that, we have to have an agile program at the very beginning. I'm not saying this is not the right program. I want you to understand you know, what I'm trying to convey here. We have to go at this program with agility in mind to understand that there may be a need or maybe even pre-planned points of decisions where we deploy a capability uh, earlier. Th that kind of innovative thought process in an acquisition program um, is one that's going to be tough to get through the current uh, acquisition structure. But it really is what this mission demands. And, and I don't have the, the answers. I think all of us up here on the, on the podium and all of you out there are going to play a big role in this. Uh, but we have to help our customer uh, come to the understanding that some defined 10-year program is not going to be the reality of what we see. And there's, there's command and control aspects of agility. There's propulsion aspects. Other folks want to weigh in on how to think about NGI? Well, I'll, I'll weigh in. I, I spent about half my career on space and half on, on missiles. And actually, we've been working things like multiple kill vehicles for over a decade. So the technology investments have been going on. Um, and I like to think of it more in terms of how the space world thinks about it. You need a platform that's going to be evolvable. You need, a, you need to have an architecture that's going to support you being able to flex with the threat and pace the threat over time. And so I think that's, that's one way that we are looking at it is how do we build a very flexible architecture that allows us to um, make sure we can evolve the system with low investments over time. I'll jump in on the command and control point because I, I, I think of it as sort of the orphan stepchild of the BMDS often, oftentimes. I mean, it's, it's sort of a, it's there, it's necessary, but it doesn't get a lot of attention. And I think uh, wrongly so, and I was had, glad to hear the Admiral earlier talk about that as a, 
But we need to maybe focus on the command and control aspect of it because like everything else, it too is getting more complex as this environment gets more complex. And, and the systems we have in place today are great, but are they good enough or can they just be sort of adapted or something bolted onto them? I don't know, I, I have my doubts personally. And so I think that we need to focus more on command and control. You know, how can we take cues from this space layer that's over our heads right now that's in development? How can we take cues from all the terrestrial based sensors? How can we incorporate AI and machine learning into all of it? It's, it, it's, it's an enterprise amongst itself and I don't think it's enough attention today, but I think it's gonna be key that we, we start to focus on it more. And the reason I don't think it gets a lot of attention is because it's just not sort of in the sexy category of stuff that, you know, kinetic intercept or perhaps a, a, a big big sensor out there. But it's it's necessary that we, we really shift a lot of focus toward command Can and control. Can you coax out for us why command and control is becoming more complex, either for the ballistic threat or for hypersonic defense? Just sort of walk, walk through, why does it become more complex? Well, I think it's for the, Ken's view, the simple reason that the environment is becoming more complex. There's more to be seen out there from a very simplistic standpoint. It's harder to detect. It's, the countermeasures are harder. Uh, it's maneuvering now. So sort of a, a, a basic rudimentary architecture command and control structure that looks at a baseball being thrown from San Francisco to New York is not going to be sufficient when you then have, you know, start interjecting all these things that dart around, fly around, hide themselves in plain view, not to mention the sheer volume of information that's out there. So uh, I, I think um, it's, a, it's a real problem that we've got to collectively tackle in the next decade that uh, up till now has really not been paid enough attention to. Okay. John, you want to? Yeah, I was just going to, I think um, a good part of that is the integration, like Sarah was saying, the space layer and what you're doing terrestrially and how they come together. Certainly. Um, there's a number of different propulsion attributes you could bring, that type of thing. But it's what I love about what MDA, SDA, Air Force, DOD is doing, they're, they're making the potential adversary guess away from a very predictable 10-year program to who knows what's coming. We've got to bring this all together and, and integrate it the right way. But there's some very neat aspects. So the, the space layer uh, this, you know, that SDA is talking about might bring very different capabilities than anyone's imagining that feeds back to battle management and really maneuverability, all those type of aspects. So um, the great thing, now we've got to help them uh, and be partners in bringing that all to fruition. Well, why don't we stay with space sensor layer there for a minute. Uh, Sarah, you talked about that and uh, as John said, it, it affects a lot of different missions and, and could come up with capabilities that, uh, that we don't know about yet. But uh, as we look at that, and this is the, the slide that Admiral Hill left on, uh, but as you look at space sensors, you know, he emphasized it's an engineering problem, not a science and technology problem. Okay, nonetheless, it's a tough engineering problem. And he was careful to talk this morning about things like bandwidth. Make sure you can get, where's the processing, things like that. Mm -hmm. If, if it, you know, sometimes I worry that, that we've got this great ambition for SSL, but it's not going to be implemented. So where do you kind of see the, the, the trouble points? in getting from here to a fielded SSL. What are some things that, that maybe aren't getting enough attention and should get more attention to say actually get this out and, and deployed? Well, first of all, I think just investment. I, I, I do think that it is mostly engineering. And so we're, we don't have to invent anything new. We do need to develop algorithms and we need to um, you know, make sure that we're able to pass the information from one satellite to the next. We need to look at the orbitology and make sure we're picking the right orbit for, for the system, or should it be a mixed uh, layered space defense, or a layered space system, just like we have a layered missile defense. So all of those aspects, I think it's largely about, you know, make the investment and industry will work together to make it happen. Anybody else on SSL? Okay, well, let me move to, to hypersonic defense. I know we've kind of been, been poking at that in, in the NGI discussion, but uh, let's just maybe, for instance, start on the, the effector side. Kinetic or non-kinetic, um, what are the prospects for taking the things off the shelf today and adapting for a hypersonic defense interceptor? And what, to what extent do we think about something brand new? Uh, anybody want to weigh in on that? I'll, I'll, um, I'll take a shot at it. I think that the answer is yes and yes. Um, you know, I think, um, as I said before, if we're not looking at using what we have now, we're going to miss a great opportunity and perhaps spend money uh, foolishly. Uh, I still think we're, we're uh, trying to uh, comprehend and understand the real capabilities of these hypersonic threats uh, and to go after a brand new um, 
one-trick pony interceptor, and I'm an interceptor person, is in my estimation not the right thing to do. Um, I, I think that inherently in many of the systems today, there are capabilities to uh, address some of the hypersonic threat space. Uh, and I'm going to give you an example. Uh, it's not one interceptor, it's part of the system. Uh, you know, I, I love Sarah's term of agility, that's what we have to build into our system. Um, but fundamentally, if we allow a hypersonic threat to come in, whether it's a regional hypersonic threat or you even heard the Admiral bring up the, the concept of a threat to the homeland from a hypersonic threat, um, if we allow it to come in uninhibited, it will be a monster to handle. And I'm just being very plain. I think anybody that studied the physics of those things understand in game, uninhibited, till it gets to in game, it is going to be almost impossible to handle. Therefore, we have to be able to inhibit it along its life path. We have to be able to make it bleed energy early. So that is taking current systems like, like uh, SM3 as an example, early if we're out with ships, and that's the beautiful part of the ships, you can put them almost anywhere. Um, you can put it out there and force an early maneuver that starts to bleed the energy. Uh, you can use THAAD, you could use SM6, you could use other interceptors that have range to not give it uninhibited approach to any target that it wants to go to. And then if we do that and we bleed the energy, frankly, many of our current terminal interceptors can deal with it. Otherwise, we're in trouble. Now, eventually, are we going to have to go look at some new capability? Yes, that's, that's uh, without a doubt in my mind something we have to go do, and, and I think probably we all are doing. But, but fundamentally, what I would say is first understand what we have and what we can do now, uh, and then get the full understanding of what the capability can be. And by the way, don't go create a one, um, a single trick pony interceptor. That is not what the taxpayer needs to pay for. I agree with Mitch. It's, it's not going to be a one-trick pony, and the answer is yes and yes. Uh, but I do think that, uh, again, to Mitch's point, that ultimately, you know, a glide phase interceptor, a true glide phase interceptor is going to be a necessity. I know you asked about kinetic, uh, but I think we need to emphasize it needs to be a layered approach. So no one kind of system is ever going to go take this kind of threat down, but it also has to extend beyond kinetics. We've got to start to think more about these other you know, electronic attack elements of it. I know directed energy is often been talking about and you know, always five years away, but no kidding, there's really real breakthroughs uh, that we need to start to employ in directed energy as well. Uh, so a host of things and a layered approach uh, that takes advantage of existing systems and terminal phases, but also starts to think about the glide phase interceptor, true glide phase. Uh, and a layered approach of a mix of kinetics and non-kinetics, I think, is the answer. I guess uh, two elements that I would just add, add to the conversation, and we've touched on uh, most of these already, but I think there's this idea of uh, integration innovation, and Mitch has touched on it. We need to inventory our current systems. Where do they have some capabilities in this regard? How can we mix and match those in a way that provides us uh, uh, some capability? And then to the extent that we have to develop new platforms, to Sarah's point, we need to ensure that we develop those with the right margins so they're extensible and can accomplish the new technologies that are being developed and will be developed to take that on. So if we think broadly about uh, integration, innovation, and margin in platforms as we develop them, we'll be better served, uh, however the final answer comes out. Good. Okay, well, let me kind of move to a, another mission, and that's, uh, that's cruise missile defense. Um, and you heard the, uh, Admiral Hill talk about that this morning. Uh, but that includes, of course, both your your subsonic and supersonic, but also these, you know, the other side, the other kind of the hypersonic missile, the scramjet uh, hypersonic cruise missile, which is not the HGV. Um, the missile defense review said go hither, and, and we're going to have to figure that out for the homeland, uh, homeland cruise missile defense. Uh, I wonder if you could talk about some of the challenges. That's so different than ballistic missile defense. Uh, some of the challenges that are uh, that are both, as he said, you know, common to the larger enterprise, uh, but also unique. Uh, separate from hypersonic uh, glide vehicle or ballistics. So what, what ought we to be thinking about? What are some opportunities for Homeland Cruise Missile Defense or regional? That's a tough Mitch, you got some, some of that already. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'll jump on it. Um, you know, foundationally, um, I, I love what the Admiral said today, and I tell my team this all the time. T too often we take these differing threats and we find everything different. 
that we have to go do. There's a lot that is similar. Um, and you know, being able to see these cruise missiles um, is a key part. Uh, the whole sensing network, uh, this is why I still am, uh, you know, as a missile person, I go around all the time saying we gotta have the sensors in space, we need them in space, we gotta have the packages out there. You know, lots of the teams are working great things there to provide us that data. So, so there are, there's a lot that's similar that we can go after. Um, but, you know, the, some of the difficulties is, you know, these, I mean, I'll still the term from you, Tom, uh, the last time we were in a meeting together and you said something like defending dirt to space and, and really the cruise missile gets down to the dirt. Um, you know, and when you fly a low altitude trajectory maneuvering, um, you know, over land or over, over water, uh, it creates tremendous uh, difficulty for our seekers to be able to pick them out of the clutter. And uh, again, I don't want to go into a technical you know, discourse here. Uh, it's not the right form for that. But foundationally, um, it's going to take a family of folks to figure out how to do that. Now, you know, as you said, SM6 today, uh, you know, it, it has broken the Navy's uh, long range defense record multiple times over the last couple of years. Um, you know, we've been able to extend it out, and the beauty of it is, you know, again, deck to as high altitude as control authority will allow it to go, we can go do. Uh, but I will tell you that these high-speed cruise missiles create even more uh, challenges for us, and there will be an, uh, you know, an evolution of what we've got to go to go um, above and beyond what we're doing today to, to address them. I, I wish I had a more simple answer, but th they're hard threats, and foundationally, um, you know, I look at what the Navy has done, and I want to tell everybody here, I'm an Army guy, right? I grew up in the Army. You know, I grew up in the Army. So I have learned Navy. Um, and their ability to do layered defense, to defend their ships, um, you know, with an Aegis combat system that's provided by Lockheed Martin and missiles that are provided by Raytheon is, pr and not just missiles, there's, there's, you know, of course, phalanx as well. That system can deal with those threats. Now that's at shorter ranges, uh, generally speaking, that we're gonna need to do and think about for homeland. But foundationally, we've got something to build upon, which is why I say don't forget we stand on the shoulder of giants like Rod Rimp and Kate Page and others who have thought through these, these things and developing these systems. And, uh, and uh, I'd be remiss not to say Admiral Meyer, I've learned to say build a little, test a little, learn a lot, right? I mean, I've learned to say that as an Army person because I believe that his mantra has paid off and great dividends for the Navy. Sarah, I think you were going to jump in on cruise missiles. Well, I was just going to say, it, it is a really tough problem. I think you said it really well, though. I mean, I think the first thing is detection and, and, and being able to have custody. I, I guess uh, the, the thing I'm thinking about for a longer term view is directed energy because of uh, cost exchange ratios with the numbers that they can produce. So that's the other part of the problem and why we need to invest there. And it's not really just. Um, um, for laser weapon systems in particular, it's not just laser scaling, it's beam control. How do we keep, keep track? Um, how do we get the energy on the target? And, and um, also the engagement timelines. Good. Well, why don't I open it up for some questions from the audience? I've got a bunch more uh, topics, but I want to give everybody else uh, an opportunity to weigh in. Uh, if you want to raise your hand, and we'll, we'll bring a mic uh, around to you. So over here first. And I want to hit the international dimension uh, as well here. Well, uh, speaking of the international dimension, um, what effect does the Trump administration's withdrawal from INF have on, and what effect do arms control treaties in general have on all of your business's efforts to make systems meant for the next generation, to um, secure against, against the next generation of hypersonics and things like that? Thank you. So arms control and hypersonic defense, one thing that occurs to me is, you know, the ability to base things on land that might have multi-mission applications. Um, we, we haven't had a whole lot of treaty restrictions on this, but other thoughts? I think it was more of an issue on the current systems that have been developed over, over the years, right? And so um, there were limitations put on, you know, how much power we could have behind our systems, basically, and how much range. So now I think that's removed for next generation right now, but it may, may come back into effect. I, I think the broader uh, area that we need to think about is why, you know, why did those treaties exist? What were they there for? 
And uh, you know, in general, uh, they're there to help avoid destabilization. And there are concerns in that regard. I mean, as we move toward ground-based systems that are going to have to do the kinds of things we've been talking about today, uh, additional boost capability, you start to get in the range of uh, you know, ICBM-type uh, capabilities to do those. So uh, do those things, regardless of whether or not trees stay in place or, or don't stay in place, become somewhat destabilizing? And where is, our, uh, where is the overall play with respect to that? Now, the Missile Defense Agency and the industry partners up here are here to do what the agency wants to do from a development standpoint. But programs have to have support. They have to have congressional support, they have to have administration support, and those kinds of things are going to weigh into the ability to garner that kind of support, so they need to be paid attention to. Anybody else on, on that? Okay, Next, we'll go to somebody else. All right, right here, and then over to this gentleman. Thank you. Uh, John Horner, Raytheon. Um, to Sarah's point, I'd like to pile on and ask a question about, uh, we look pretty good at looking at the uh, 1v1 or two shots versus one, but these salvos take into PACOM, sea-based scenario, defending the fleet. When you got 40 missiles coming in, uh, this capacity issue, what do you guys see as game changers that will help get after that, either from an interceptor capacity and tubes or directed energy, high power mic microwave, et cetera? Where do you see the ability to get beyond just kind of looking at a uh, high fidelity 1v1 intercept? Well, I think, I mean, I think in the past the, the requirements were set and, uh, quite a while ago, and I think that the architecture was very good, and I think you need to have multiple tools in your tool set again. And so for those sort of very complex threats, you need to come up with a more innovative design that's going to get you back in the cost exchange ratio you need to have. Um, and so for that reason, I think that's why we've always looked at multiple kill vehicle systems, right? So. And in, in that effect, uh, I think it's really important that we seize this opportunity um, to develop something that's going to outpace the threat in the future. Yeah, I think maybe, um, John, I know you'll appreciate this point. A good, good time just to think about the offense-defense mix part of this equation that, um, you know, raid sizes of infinity, uh, and that, no, that's not what you're saying, I understand, you increased raids, but we, we've got to keep be mindful of the fact that all these systems are designed you know, to buy time for the warfighter, combat commander, whomever, uh, and that the offensive arm, which I know you're very, very well versed in, comes into play here. So how much time can we buy? How much battle space can we buy to allow a response? And that's a whole just important thing to keep in mind about missile defenses generally that they're never really designed to be a catch-all or a catcher's mitt or some kind of a force field or bubble around, uh, around defended areas. I would uh, I would also say, um, you know, having learned a little bit um, in some of my experiences uh, with a previous international customer, um, that our sensor ability to say, to to we assume that if they shoot ten at us, that all ten of them are going to hit something we care about. Mm. You know, our our fidelity of our sensor systems are such that we've got to be able to let some of them go. We've got to be able to make those judgments and let some of them go. That's a hard judgment to make, but what we don't want to, particularly on some of these sophisticated threats, which, I mean, quite frankly, we, we, we all look at the hypersonic threat and we go, wow. But, you know, really, that's still very hard, and if they shot 10 of them at us, I'd be hard pressed to believe that three of them would get to us of its own fruition. I mean, it is, it's a difficult proposition now. You know, I'm not going to argue about their reliability and all that kind of stuff because I honestly don't know. I just know how hard it is for us. Uh, and so I'm assuming it's pretty hard for them as well. Um, and so, again, it's, it's not just about interceptor to interceptor. It's about making smart decisions. And then, again, we, we could go into directed energy is going to come. It's not just about lasers, high power microwave, other systems of that nature. Um, but, but I, you know, I, I look at some of the things that, that teams are working um, out there to be able to deal with these raid scenarios. Uh, we, didn't, we haven't talked about discrimination at all, but I mean, if you're talking about, uh, you know, the EXO threats, um, you know, again, we cannot be, we can never be in the business of addressing everything that they can throw at us. Ken pointed that out. So discrimination is another key attribute that we have got to continue to work on, and there are some really breakthrough things happening in that area. Sarah, you jump in? Okay. You know, of course, with the hypersonic things, 
unlike uh, the ballistics, it's harder to let them go because you don't know if they're going to come back to you. Whereas you don't, it may look like it's going in the desert, but it may not be. All right, we got a gentleman over here. Brian Rubey, Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation intern. Um, you talked about a little bit about the strategic balance. You mentioned kind of balancing threats. How does the industry approach ensuring that the new technologies that are emerging, like the multiple kill vehicles and things like that, don't push that balance into a arms race where we can't get out in front of the threats that are coming at us? Well, I, I think it's, there's going to be a, a balance there, and we need to make sure that the political arena is uh, completely employed and invested in understanding of where uh, where the nation should be going in that regard. I, yeah, I think there's no question that you know multiples are going to be needed uh, to to defend against what we see coming. Uh, to take up Ken's point and and the balance between offensive and defensive systems. I, I would characterize it not as what can, what time can we provide, but what time do we need to provide so that there's a thoughtful uh, integration of those capabilities and requirements are set such that we don't uh, go further than we have to, but we go far enough to have some margin uh, above what, uh, what is necessary to uh, uh, defeat the initial wave such that our strategic uh, systems can come into play. So I, I think the, the conversation needs to be uh, uh, held at larger venues than just obviously the, the missile defense agency and we need to be engaged in those uh, to ensure that all that thinking is happening because it affects the fundamental requirements that that flows down from the beginning it should there should be thoughtful dialogue at that level as uh, requirements to the individual uh, procurement agencies are levied and then that uh, architectural uh, 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 disaggregation that I talked about earlier is fundamental to that. Once you decide what element of the system is going to do what, whether it's uh, offensive or strategic or defensive, then you can break those requirements down and allocate those properly to the elements of the system. And I, that very thoughtful top-down threat mission architecture uh, thought process needs to happen. And then the, a fractal of that same approach needs to happen at every level of the organization as that requirement set comes. How do you uh, uh, deploy uh, those individual requirements down to the components of the system. And I, I think there needs somehow to be better dialogue top down with industry represented in those early conversations because industry understands the innovations that might be employed to help guide those architectures. So I, I think we need to have robust discussion at the very top level uh, coming down in order to inform best solutions. Let, let, me try to re let me try to take that question. I think it's an interesting one. And, and directed to, to, to the panel in terms of the industrial base and supply chains. Because, you know, I think Admiral Hill talked this morning about, you know, the taking risk on, on uh, capacity, right? Which occasionally we've addressed as in 2018 uh, plus up and things like that. But you, you look at the, the relatively small numbers of some of these exquisite systems we've been buying, and there's not just a whole lot of uh, ability to, to juice it up overnight. Uh, you know, what is the what is the industrial base capability to build lots and lots of, of these things right now, given that we've had it dialed down uh, for so long? So I would say from an, from the industry's perspective, you know, what degree of, of insight and, and transparency from your customers, you know, is going to be helpful so that you have that ability to ramp up on certain airframes or certain propulsion types? Uh, because, I mean, I guess I look at this and I see it's going to be a challenge to ramp up uh, production of any any one thing, uh, given where we are now. Thoughts on that? You can't create su supply chains overnight. Yeah, yeah. a couple of things. Um, certainly, uh, solid propulsion, large solid propulsion. Um, there's a couple of major providers, um, and it's a real issue. Um, and several of the types of liquid propulsion too, because they're uniquely uh, used by DoD. And so, to your point, and I'd offer to the question you're asking too, it's a lot of the discussion about what's the threat, at, it's not what we want to do necessarily, it's what might be on the horizon that we have to defend against, never mind offense, but just defense for the United States. So you look back at industrial capability for the United States and say, uh, do we have the basic capability? Are we leading to the future and in innovation with new um, capabilities that we need? And then what's that minimal capacity that we need to then surge for a threat requirement? And they're not easy questions. And it's not, it's certainly primes and second tiers, but then it's even the the suppliers of whether it's chemicals, raw materials, all those type of things, 
I think this administration has tried to take a holistic look at that, but there's a lot of work to go to make sure, even for what we know today, that we're positioned to be able to effect that if we had to search. You know, one, one precept that's important in this regard is early industry engagement in the, in the initial thought processes as they develop, because as you mentioned, Tom, I mean, the lead time to generate some of these capabilities and capacities from a uh, manufacturing integration standpoint is long. And so the better industry is involved in the upfront discussions about where, uh, what are the right technologies that uh, look like they will be employed, uh, the, the better that uh, sort of lead time can be addressed. And I think, um, you know, clearly th there is some progress being made in that area. I don't know if give credit where credit's due. We're, we're being asked a lot of questions now, as all of us uh, said on this panel certainly are, about how fast can we ramp and what are the ways and what do you need from us from the government standpoint to be able to ramp production? Um, so the right questions are beginning to be asked. The question becomes, um, you know, the response times are the response times for us to be able to react to uh, what some estimates are would need to happen if we were to go into some kind of an escalated uh, situation and so um, you know we're not there today more work needs to happen uh, but but foundationally I'm, I'm not sure the way we used to think about it in that there is some minimum you know quantities that if you keep us at this level we can get to where you need to fast enough because you know we can just see the world today the escalation is going to be rapid it's not going to be uh, some prolonged um, you know, uh, engagement, it's, it's going to happen, and when it happens, it's gonna to be too late to, ask, to be able to ramp up the numbers that are needed. So I, I will offer this, um, you know, I do see these things like multi-year procurements as opportunities to position industry to be able to do those sort of uh, increased quantities, because in that, you know, we can take a five-year or a seven-year time frame uh, to work with our suppliers and uh, others to build that uh, inherent capacity in versus year to year when we don't know are we going to get another contract next year. So, so that is part of what we're doing and looking at with our customers inside of multi-year procurements that we're doing now on SM6 and SM3, uh, but that's not the entire answer. Are there other systems that need multi-year or would benefit from it? The more, the more that um, can be committed as far as how far is an investment going to take you, the more we can build the industrial base. Uh, and so I think that's, that's the key point that I think Mitch is making, which is, um, you know, don't, don't do lots of studies or phased approaches, you know, commit to a certain number of interceptors or, or what, what it is that you need to have in order for us to build that base. Okay. Anybody else out here? Good. In the back over here. Hello, Jeremiah Rosman from the Association of the U.S. Army. Uh, I wanted to ask you, kind of piggybacking a little bit off the last question, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages for U.S. industry vis-a-vis uh, -vis other countries like Russia and China's air and missile defense industries, and uh, what does that mean for uh, foreign military sales as well? Are you, are you talking S-400 kind of stuff, or...? So the, the, the global competition for, I was actually going to go here, the global competition for air missile defense. Thoughts on that? I, I've got to jump on that one. <laughs> I thought you might. I, I will tell you, at the executive level um, in Raytheon, it, it, this last 12 months has been crazy. We, we no longer have discussions. I mean, I'm telling you, these folks up here are our partners. We don't have discussions about how are we going to go compete against them. We're going into markets and competing against China and Russia. I mean, head to head with China and Russia, and it's it's a new world for us. And uh, and I'm telling you, I, I'm speaking for Mitch Stevenson right now, not for Raytheon, but for Mitch Stevenson. We as a nation better wake up to that, because foundationally they are selling to our allies, and over time that's going to change the calculus for the relationships that we've relied on for years to keep the world safe. Are there structural changes? Are there rules? Are there incentives right now in the U.S. market that affect that very question, your ability to partner, uh, that, that should be brought up? 
I don't think that there are rules in, in these markets that we're competing in. I mean, we can partner up here as we see fit to partner. Um, I, I'm just saying that we're waking up to the fact that in those markets, um, I can give you an example, and I won't tell you what country it was, but I was in a country recently, um, you know, got up uh, for breakfast, went down to the hotel, you know, um, little area for breakfast, and there setting four set seats over for me was a group of Russians that were there to sell S-400, you know. And then in the Middle East now, we know as a fact with these attacks on, that we just saw, these attacks on the Saudi oil fields, the Russia's in there offering them a system. They're in there offering them a system. And so, again, th there's no rules for them to not be able to do that, but we're competing, you know, against different um, types of competition that, um, that, you know, I'm not saying that our capabilities, I'm telling you right now, our capabilities uh, are far greater than theirs when I look at it. I look at an S-400 system, I don't know how anybody sustains an S-400 system. There's multiple radars, multiple launchers, multiple everything. That is a nightmare for, uh, a, for a force that wants to deploy. Nonetheless, they're selling them to NATO allies. So, you know, we have to be aware of that. And, uh, and again, I'll, I'll be quiet because that's, that's a passionate subject for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Actually, let's sort of stay on that for a minute. The, just the, the FMS and the, the foreign sales uh, uh, more broadly, I mean, over the past year alone, we've had Patriot, uh, we've had lots of Aegis activity, uh, IBCS, I mean, across the board. Um, uh, yes, there's the competition with the Russians and Chinese, but, but what, what are the, uh, the roadblocks to actually servicing that demand signal? You know, uh, is, for instance, U.S. customers getting in the way of, of some of those foreign military sales, whether it's the U.S. Navy or, or other folks? Um, what is the ability to kind of sell as much of the stuff we want to sell or, or services we want to sell for the air and missile defense side? Are we in our, way, in our own way in any manner? All right, I, I see some sm smirks and smiles, but nobody wants to jump on that grenade. All right, any, anybody else? Uh, <laughs> okay, well, um, I, think, uh, I think we're kind of uh, uh, hit all the topics I had. Any, uh, maybe we could sort of start with you, John, and work back down for some, some closing thoughts about maybe anything that the, uh, the larger discussion needs to think about from, from your company's perspective. Just uh, reiterate what I said before, I'll tell you, and it's so great to be with this panel because you hear the thought leadership that's going on, not just nationally, but internationally. And coming at that, that system, you're looking up on the wall there in a very creative way. Everyone's working on that right now, and we have the administration leadership, the military leadership doing that too. It's actually a great time, and now it's just bringing all that hard work together. I, I would just say, uh, you know, uh, having worked the missile defense equation for about the last 25 years, I, you know, I'm very proud to see where we are as a team. And, uh, and foundationally, um, you know, Admiral Hill said it today, um, you know, w I believe we have the right leadership in place. Th th things will change. Uh, things will be different, but that evolution, I think, is going to be positive under his leadership. Uh, the construct that we're moving out on uh, as an industry, uh, government team and we look forward to those challenges uh, in the future. Yeah, from the North of Grumman perspective, uh, these problems are real. They're very real. Um, it's, it's, I'm proud to say our company's committed to working on them and solving the hard problems. I'm also proud to say that the spirit of cooperation amongst not only the individuals represented on the stage today, but, but everything that's behind them and their companies and many other out there in our nation is, is really um, powerful. And, uh, and it's it's, it's, these are tough problems, but you know, I'm an optimist, and I'm, I'm optimistic that together, collectively, not just industry, but industry and our partnership with government, we can get answers to them. But we've got to stay on it because these aren't going away. So I'll, um, I'll start with the space layer. Um, I think it's really important to recognize we have incredible capabilities also in space right now today. And what we're talking about, again, is extending that to um, pace the advanced threat. And the more we stitch together the space uh, and other domains, the better off we will be as far as having an integrated uh, missile defense capability. And then the last thing is, um, you know, we don't need to start over. So 
we're, what we need to do is just selectively put innovative technologies in place that are going to allow us to um, continue to grow for the future. The one, the one uh, area that I thought we all hit on, which I thought was important, is building up, building a system that's going to last for the future. So making sure we have the margin in there for us to be able to pace the threat and a, an open architecture that allows us to, to perform. Certainly resonate with all those uh, comments. Thanks again to CSIS for hosting this. I think this kind of uh, dialogue is very important, and we need to we need more of it, and we need more of it at uh, more levels. We talked about uh, you know this kind of dialogue going on with industry engagement at the uh, bridge between uh, strategic uh, offensive and defensive systems. So, would love to see more of that. Appreciate working with this group of partners up here. I think Mitch said it well. We. Uh, we couple and, and work well together, and this nation has a great industrial capability. Uh, we can do amazing things. We have to make sure that we're focused on doing the right things because affordability is always a concern. This kind of dialogue helps uh, drive those uh, things out and, and postures us better to, to be able to provide the capability the nation needs. Great. Well, uh, thanks to all five of you for coming out today. Uh, I don't think there'll be any shortage of, dial uh, shortage of dialogue about these things. Uh, the mission space is just, uh, you know, ballooning and mushrooming all the time. So uh, thanks to all, you all for your time. Thanks, to everybody, for coming out, and uh, hope to see you again soon. All right.